Hello, good evening and welcome. This is Wednesday night, the best night of the week, other than one where there's a rugby league game. My name's Dave Parkinson and this is the 13 Pro Am Community Rugby League Show. We're delighted to be with you for yet another episode and I'm delighted that I'm looking across the table at my co-presenter. It's Steve Beach who's back. How are you doing, Steve? You all right? Uh, I'm not doing too bad, Parky. Just on the tail end of a cold, which I've had for a couple of weeks, so I may sound a bit nasally and I do apologise for that. But yeah, uh, certainly look at uh, getting back in the saddle and uh, hopefully we've uh, we, we, we've sort of uh, structured things slightly different this week, which I think moving forward is, is going to be better for us and for the show as a whole. Uh, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good things coming. Uh, there is, there is. There's a lot of good things coming. So over the course of the next hour or however long we're on for, uh, you're going to be hearing from uh, a guy who I got to know quite well when I was out in Italy last year, Rio McQuiston uh, from Millham, to tell us all about their big news. They, yes, there has been a couple of other big names that have been involved rather than John Asiata or, uh, has been mentioned <laughs> quite heavily over recent days. But there is a, a big name that has emerged up in Cumbria. Um, so um, he, he's going to have a, a bit of a chat and tell me all about how their season's been going, how things are looking for them moving forward, as well as revealing the big name and talking a bit more about how um, he settled in. Um, we'll also be hearing some post-game reaction from uh, the game I was at at the weekend, which was, got to check my notes here, it was Lee Miners Rangers up against York Acorn. Uh, a real, I was going to say, this time last year you would have been thinking, right, th- there's a survival but it would have been the other way around yeah. because um, Lee Miners were in the top six last year and uh, York Acorn were fighting and scrapping back for every out, point. Yeah, yeah. So the boot's on the other foot this season. It's not been the most sparkling of campaigns as far as Lee Miners' Rangers are concerned. So yes, so after the, uh, after the match at the weekend that I was at between uh, Lee Miners' Rangers and York Acorn, I caught up with Dave Rowlands and Dean Barmer. Um, interesting chat between the pair of them, and uh, I'm really looking forward to you listening to Dean, uh, because not only is he taking the rugby league field again, playing in the Premier Division at 41 years of age, he's also amongst the coaching staff of the uh, successful Bedford High School team, which will be playing in a prelude at Wembley ah. uh, in the Year 7 Schools final. So I, I mentioned, you know, I, I, I always like this. It's one of my best things of the, of the year whenever I'm involved in, um, you know, the uh, championship schools. Yeah. Uh, it's one of my favourite, favourite things that I'm involved in. It's so great to see the kids enjoying themselves and getting the chance to, to, to play it at a huge level of rugby league. And um, the Year 7 is one that, you know, gets played before uh, the Wembley finals. And it's a, it's a packed day if you're going down to Wembley yeah, this time, isn't it? The, 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 the schools one has always been uh, one that I've always kept my eyes out for. If I remember rightly, when I went against watching Warrington and Saints uh, during the COVID sort of years, as it were, uh, if I'm not wrong, I think I'm, Great Sankey played in, 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 as one of the teams, uh, which was great because obviously... I, to my first place after I got married was was in Great Sankey, so we've got a bit of affection for it there. But it's uh, it's great. I've always liked it. I've always liked having the kids on at Wembley, and I think that is right, and that should never change for me. Never change. Uh, so we'll be hearing from that. We've also got a chat with Jonathan Mann coming up as well. Who um, it was great to have a natter with him uh, because there's been a couple of Lions internationals that have happened over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the first one of which I couldn't be at. But I was the last Wednesday evening as the uh, England under 17s got beat by a French under 17 side. And yes, before you you look at me and you ask me, they did look like under 17s <laughs> players this time. I have to say. Um, so we've got lots and lots to come. We'll also have a look and dip our toes into what's happening in the Northwest Men's League, uh, into Cumbria, into the Yorkshire Men's League, and we've got a round up from uh, around the other leagues as well. So plenty to come. Uh, I do want to start with the uh, National Conference League, if I may. So I'll run through the results 
I've got me right up from the game that I was at, and then we'll we'll go ahead with the uh, the first interview. So, um, action in the Premier Division last week saw Siddle defeat Hull Dockers by 34 points to nil. That could be a really important win as far as Siddle are concerned with their season. They've not really got going over the course of the campaign, um, but now find themselves fifth bottom after their sixth win of the season. So a couple of tries from Turner, a couple from McCallum, May and Blackburn also going over with Blackburn adding five goals. Siddle were good on the day. You've got to be very pleased with that, haven't they? Oh, very much so, very much so. Uh, Another club that will be pleased with this result, Lot Lane 14, Kells 12. Uh, And I've got to say as well that last week's show, I I was saying that they were raising money for charity Mm -hmm. over at Lot Lane. So they do this every year. Uh, And this year's charity was, uh, I think it was Childhood Liver Diseases. Yeah. Um, And they've managed to raise £1,200 for the charity, which is absolutely fantastic. Well done to everyone there. And well done to the big-hearted players as well, because everybody, and that includes the Kells players, they paid to play at the weekend. Um, and they have, there was a donation from yeah. everybody that went through That's the gate. Good. So absolutely fantastic. I really love, good. I love hearing stories like that. So well done, Lot Lane. Well done, Kells. Sometimes what happens on the field is not the most important thing. Mm. In well, my we've, opinion. we've said this, you know, about community sides. It's not just about the rugby, you know, being played. It's about the the whole whole experience of being as a, a part of that club. Absolutely fantastic. Um, unfortunately, the game between Rochdale Mayfield and Wigan St. Patrick's didn't take place. Um, this was due to the fact that Wigan St. Pat's were unable to raise a team, which is very worrying from my point of view when you kind of look at it because you're thinking Wigan St. Pat's, one of the founder members of the mm. National Conference League, not being able to raise a side, having you know so many players unavailable. Um, I, I do know that there's other things that are going on at that club. Unfortunately, they don't have a, a reserve set up this season. Mm. They don't have an A team. Um, they're struggling at under 18 level. So at the moment, the players that they have is what they've got. Um, I, I do understand as well that that game has been rescheduled for a little bit later on in the season. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll try and... Uh, Obviously, get to the bottom of that. So, it's not so good what that, will happen it? with that, with regards to will, will let there be any sort of, uh, you know, sort of fine or anything like that, or, or because it's going to be played for the down the line, is 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 that you know sort of okay in that in that respect? I think in the initial. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, from mm. a from an NCL management committee point of view, that the, they always look and see. You know, and try and get to the bottom of why games mm. haven't been played, because um, that's very important. Like we've said in the past, because the, 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 there is a need to people to be open and honest. Then hopefully, then these sorts of things can you know help can be given to eradicate these sort of things happening in yeah. the future. I think I think in the past there has been you know like fines handed out for yeah. games not taking place, but I think in in this instance yeah. where there's the chance of rearranging it. Yeah, which is... So go comments. forward and the idea is to work with the yeah, clubs, yeah. you know, because if you think there's other clubs in the NCL this season that haven't been able to fulfil fixtures at certain points mm. of the season, I, I'm thinking East Leeds being being one. And, right. and at the moment, you look at East Leeds fixture list and it looks like they're, they're going to be playing uh, sort of Wednesdays, Saturdays, Wednesdays, Saturdays for a couple of weeks at the back end of the season to catch up with the, mm. you know, the, the fixtures that they've had to, to, had to rearrange so it's disappointing that it's disappointing for Rochdale Mayfield as yeah. well who were starting to pick up form again um, and obviously they're looking at um, you know bigger fish ahead um, they're going to be um, one of the two sides that are featuring on our league this weekend so I'm sure that they would have liked to have gone into that on the back of a game yeah. um, obviously um, I'll be trying to ask a couple of questions of coaching staff and see you know, what, just what sort of impact that, that actually does have. But um, I am glad to see that they have got this game and it looks like they've um, you know been able to rearrange this particular fixture. Um, on brighter note, certainly for Wathbrow Hornets, Wathbrow Hornets 48, Thato Heath Crusaders 10. Uh, and I've got to say, Jake Moore was the star here. Two tries and six goals. Uh, and a certain Holgate grabbing a hat trick as well. So absolutely tremendous performance that from Wathbro Hornets. They were twenty four points to six to the good at half time and they managed to double their advantage. Tries from Saunders and Paul came the way of Thato Heath Crusaders, but ultimately they weren't good enough and it's been a bit of a 
a real up and down campaign as far as that or Heath are concerned. You know, I'm looking at the, the table. Uh, they currently sit just above Siddle. They've won seven games out of 17, but lost 10. And that sort of inconsistency is something that we don't often associate no, with totally that right. or Heath, yeah, do we? Yeah. So I, I know that they are, um, you know, sort of... Um, having a, a bit of a season of transition really mm. there's a lot of players that won't a lot of people around the national conference who won't be too familiar with some of the guys that are now playing first team for Thato Heath Crusaders mm. don't get me wrong there's a lot of people in Thato will be probably yeah. screaming at the show at the moment going well, we know about all these lads they've been with us for years and years and years and that's the encouraging thing that they're starting to filter through yeah. but it's almost like there's a changing of the guard that's yeah, happening yeah. there and that's how it should be and, and that's what like we were discussing there before with the Rochdale, Mayfield, Wigan, St. Pat's, that's what you would hope, you know, we'll, we'll, they'll try and fill in those gaps so that type of thing will start to happen with them again. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, and you might have to go through a couple of lean years yeah. whilst those players bed in, but yeah. the hope is that those guys will then step up, they'll learn as they're progressing uh, and, you know, results will obviously improve the I'll tell you one result, though, that rocked the entire National Conference League. It's this one. West Hull 20, Hunslet ARLFC 4. Now, West Hull led by eight points to nil at half time, thanks to uh, scores from Masiki and Shaw. Um, Wilson ended up kicking three goals Wellburn getting one they scored one try in the second half through Moore and managed to restrict Hunslet to a try seven minutes from the end by uh, Tyler Dargan um, you're going some of you restricting that we, we've spoke yeah. so um, yeah. so so well about Hunslet and they deserve to have a lot of things spoken mm. about them we should start speaking about West Hull in the same sort of mm. fashion. And, and I certainly have been doing, if you notice, over the second half of the season. Because I think ever since I saw them play against Hull Dockers in the first um, game of the season that was broadcast on, on our league, yeah, they've done nothing but look up. They've scored like so many points. You, you look at it now and they scored, they're the top scorers in the National Conference League um, Premier Division. They've scored 543 points mm. in 17 games. So... They know how to attack yeah. this side. And don't get me wrong, this West Hull side was a little bit changed from some of the, what the, the sides that they have been able to put out. That's a massive, massive result. That's huge. And as a result of that, we've now got a three-way a three -way, um, race for who's going to finish league leaders. Yeah. So you've got Hunslet still out there with 28 points, Wathbro Hornets on 27, West Hull on 26. The end of season is going to be epic when you look at it and we've got five games left. Well, the thing is as well, the, now it's, it's sort of, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, sort of not shattered, but it shows that Onslet are, are uh, you know, they're not invincible. I mean, they've, got, they've had three defeats now this season. Uh, at one point at the beginning of the season, we were sort of going... Phew, who's going to beat him? Yeah. He's going to get anywhere near him. These, it was know. almost like it was a good result if he got within ten points. Exactly. Of it, wasn't yeah, it? yeah. But now it's sort of there's got to be that doubt in the mind as well. You know, as much as you can beg yourselves up, as uh, yeah, you know, we're okay. We'll, we'll go straight. To, that that's going to put doubt in the mind. It opens. Got to be. It opens things up beautifully for it us, does. though, when it we're does, talking yeah. about it, yeah. doesn't it? So yeah. um, thank you, Hunslet. Thank you, West Hull. Thank you, Othbro Hornets, yeah. for making it a really interesting race to who will get league leaders. Now, there's one game that I didn't mention. That was the game that I was at, and this was Lee Miners Rangers taking on York Acorn. Uh, Lee Miners Rangers, they boosted the Impact Performance National Conference Premier Division survival hopes in claiming their first win in four attempts in recent seasons against playoff chasing York Acorn. In a game dominated by defence at Twist Lane, Miners got over for three tries and kept their opponents scoreless. A damp afternoon started with both sides trading territory, but it was Lee Miners Rangers that struck in the 10th minute when a pinpoint kick from versatile Harvey Gotts, who has played loose forward, second row and halfback this season, and that was touched down on the right wing by Noah Lancelot after a scramble into the corner. York Acorn then saw winger Luke Swales held up over the line in the 22nd minute, while Miners sent on Deck Flannery, and he was somehow hauled down before the line at the opposite end. Acorn had their moments, 
with an effervescent showing from Hooker Alfie Crawford lifting them. But with injuries taking a heavy toll, the backline reshuffles gradually left their attack blunt in the face of Miners' committee tackling. I think I counted that they lost both starting halfbacks during the game. Yeah. So that was a you know it, it meant that I think they had the full but the starting fullback playing halfback at the end um, and the replacement Hooker in the middle. So it was a, it was a really stunted effort and they just couldn't get beyond this this blanket defence that was in front of them from Lee Miners Rangers. Towards the end of the first half, Jack Hamer from Lee Miners Rangers kicked an excellent 40-20, but the York side held firm. Miners were particularly solid defensively, with Harry Darby, Matt Parks, Joe Connor, Dean Barmer and Hamer all impressing. And they had to wait until just after half-time for their second try. This was an individual effort from 30 metres by Marco Williamson, who glided through the first line of defence before finishing between two would-be tacklers on the left. As with his first goal attempt, Gotts was wide with the conversion, and it was eight points to nil. Acorn responded with some more sprightly rook play from Crawford on the back of strong Nathan Welsh carries, and Davy Burns was hauled down close in the 50th minute. Then, with 15 minutes remaining, Acorn thought they had opened their account when Toby Woodall grounded between the posts, but the effort was disallowed, and in the remonstrations that followed, a visiting spectator was sent off by referee Andy Will- Adam Williams. Got to say, it was, it, it was he never shut up, this spectator, and he's having a go at the touch judge, so referee's gone right across. Add a word, showing him the red card, and um, you've been at, you've been to Twist Lane at Miners, haven't I you? I have, yeah. So, yeah. so y- it was the it was on the the, the, sh- the not not the side closest to the clubhouse. It was yeah. on the opposite side. I know what you mean, yeah. yeah. So he sent him off in the corner, which meant that he's had to walk all, all, all the way behind and go out the gate, and he ended up watching the rest of the game through the fence Fence. like that he was he he, he was like clinging on to the fence and still cheering and still doing whatever but obviously he got dismissed Uh, we don't condone the type of language which he must have used at that particular time and fair play to the referee for not good to see for you know not not standing for it and and, you know being forceful when he needed to be forceful so well done Adam Williams Um, now back to the game and York Acorn halfback Nathan Hamilton he tried to inspire the visitors and they again went close through George Hunt, but came up with nothing. As the sides tired, mistakes mounted up. However, Lee Miners had the final set in the 77th minute, when Craig Ashall kicked wide and wing Tom Burnett rose highest to claim and touch down to secure the 12-0 win. Um, so yeah, a fantastic result there for, for Lee Miners Rangers. As I say, they've, they've certainly struggled... Um, but seem to have picked up their form in the last three or four weeks. Mm. They've picked up a, a couple of really, really decent wins. And now they can start looking up the table. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's funny about this one, the Parker, because I, I actually watched part of this on, on YouTube. Yes, That's Terry Gorman was streaming it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, straight away, I, I spotted, obviously, Lancelot and, and Williamson from, obviously, from our, when we were doing the... Uh, Eight, or when you were doing the 18s and I, I was watching them down at, when they were doing the, the trials at uh, Pilks uh, and uh, yeah uh, two great players two great players there uh, now after the game I caught up with Dave Rowlands and Dean Barmer we discussed that win uh, and Dave and Dean were both particularly happy about the performance of the team especially the way that they dominated in the middle of the field. I also asked Dean as well about his experience in assisting uh, to coach the Year 7 at Bedford High School team that has made its way to Wembley this season. Uh, and here's that interview right now. Well, Dave, I'm catching up with you. I seem to be quite a good luck charm for Lee Miners. Every time I turn up, you seem to get a win. Yeah, um, to be fair, when we're on the uh, wrong side of a result, I keep thinking to myself, why is Dave Parkin out here today? <laughs> 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 no, uh, joking apart, I think um, that's probably our best performance this season against the top five side. Uh, last three times we've played them, they beat us, so that says something. I mean, last year we finished above them quite a few spots in the league, but they beat us all in a way. They were a good side, really well coached. Uh, and for, keep a side like them to zero today is a massive achievement for us. Is that what the more pleasing thing is? You kept yeah. them to nil? Yeah, obviously the conditions kind of played into that a little bit. So there weren't a lot of rugby on show and ball were greasy. But I just thought, I thought we turned up for each other today. Um, and you could see we wanted it more than them. And to be fair, there's different ways of winning a game of rugby, yeah. isn't there? And it was, it was ticker today, to be fair. Yeah, um, I think... I think we turned a bit of a corner last few last few weeks. We went to Hull Dockers, kept them to zero. 
obviously we've played St Pat's last week, get them to zero in second half and get these to zero here today. So attitude, I've questioned the attitude of the group. Do they want to be in the Prem? Simple as that. Because I know this group's big, big enough, good enough for being top six and we've been bottom at league most of the season. So I've seen a reaction, a massive one, and it's great to see. Do you say you can start looking up rather than over your shoulder? I think we've got to take each game as it comes. Um, obviously, we'll go to Thato next Friday night under the lights. Um, they're not the team they was, but it was only three years ago, the best team in Europe, so you can't underestimate them. You kind of don't know which team they're going to put out on field at the minute, and if they're at full strength, they're one of them teams that can beat anyone in the league. So uh, we, we get some more players back next week, which is a bit bizarre. I mean, we've got six starters, what I'd call starters, that are out for the season. So that's where we are, and we're still turning out performances like that. Because uh, it is a bit of a mix and match side at the minute, isn't yeah. it? With all due respect. Yeah, so me and Dow worked this out the other day. So the spine of the team, one, six, seven, nine. We've had 12 different combinations, all like as, as we are now. And you, when you're playing these top sides and they've got that same spine there all the time, and we're kind of working with something on a Thursday night. And then, so obviously, Josh, Josh Waterworth's played his first game of rugby there at fullback in four years. Last time he played was for Tom Wood at uh, under 18s, kind of fell out with game. Come and watched us last week against St. Pax and said, fancy a bit of that. Come training on Tuesday, looked like he'd never been away. To be fair, you could, he gassed a little bit there, but obviously he's done two training sessions in four and a half years. So what a start back! Yeah, what a start back! Uh, and and never played full back, was always an half back. And I've asked him just come in and do me a job because we've got that many people out. And you seem to have been sort of mixing and matching again, even during that game at half back. Yeah, so obviously Josh pulled up with his quad, which is acceptable because he's not played in so long. So we get the old master Craig Ashall and just push him into halves, and he, he basically schools the game, doesn't he? So when he went in there, it was just calm, everything with ease, basically. When he went there, kicking him into corners, just an old dead, knows how to play them kind of conditions, no panic whatsoever. Uh, now, Dean, I know you've been standing there quite quiet, just listening there. First of all, congratulations on getting Bedford Eye to that final. That's got to be a massive, massive achievement, and what a great day. Oh, massive achievement for the lads. Uh, started off with them, uh, jumped in with the teacher, said to him, I said, listen, I know these lads are uh, capable of winning anything. If you have the right team and you put them together, they'll go on and win things. They went on, won the uh, Wigan schools in Northwest counties, so they're on for a first ever treble at Wembley for a year seven team, which I'm over the moon about. I'll never take praise as a coach. I think it's all on the players. If you earn their respect, I'll always say they'll run through walls for you and, and that's what they do. Yeah. Um, but again, they've got someone to really look up to, haven't they? Because you're still running through walls too. <laughs> well, yeah, you're right. I, I'm, do you know what? I remember uh, I come over, I had a, had a chat with Dave. I've been mates with Dave for a long time. And I said to him, I said, listen, uh, I want one more go at Prem. I know I'm not that young spring chicken I used to be and all my, my muscles and bones are, are wearing away. I told Dave, I said, listen, give me a chance. I said, if it don't look right for me, tell me the truth. And he said he would. And, you know, he's backed me. He's given me a chance, which I'll always be grateful for. Listen, for, for still be playing at 41 in Prem, listen... Uh, it's brilliant for me. I love me, my eldest lad being on board, watching me again, and he absolutely loves it, you know, and that, that's why I carried on. And then, obviously, I know that we go back to a, a time when we were both yeah. at, at Lee East, but you started off at Miners anyway, so what's it like to be back? Oh, mate, it's... You know what, you can't you can't change your past, you, you make decisions for yourself, um, but, listen, it's the best thing I ever did, not just for me, for my lads, my lads absolutely love it here. We, we've all been, listen, I, I never knew any different. I never fell out with club when I left the first time. I always knew I'd be welcome back with open arms and they have done. And do you know what? I'm absolutely loving it. Absolutely loving it here. Um, and, and just a quick quick one on the game today as well, because um, you've got some younger books around you these days. Yeah. Um, how do you think that they went? Do you know what? Listen, uh, we played York Acorn at theirs uh, beginning of the season. Listen, they, they absolutely... It is off the perk. They're a physical team. We know what they're all about. Listen, me being an experienced player, same as, um, same as Joe Connor, you have to match them. If you don't match them in the middle, they'll blow you away. And do you know what? Today, nothing against them men, but 
I think we absolutely dominated middle and, and we absolutely bashed them. And I'll, I'll be honest, I don't think they've been hit like that all season. And if, if they said they have, then I think they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, winners are grinners. Um, congratulations, and this could be the rise and rise of Lee Miners now. Oh, I'm, I'm really hoping. Listen, I don't want to be finishing on a, a relegation. Hey, listen, we keep on winning. Like Dave says, we're taking each game as it comes, and you know, who knows? We're what, six points, four points from playoffs? Anything's possible, <laughs> do you know? But listen, I'll just keep going, me. Let's just keep winning, and, and who knows? Yeah. <laughs> To be fair, I mean, that's the beauty at National Conference, isn't it? I mean, I've been watching the results from elsewhere and the different divisions, and um, I had a similar sort of conversation with Crossfields the other week because they've been on a losing run, losing run. They've got three wins together. Suddenly, they're looking up. Yeah. Listen, anybody in this division can beat anyone. We've seen it all the way through the season. I mean, us against old Dockers at home, let it slip, you know. We went there, we absolutely dominated the game. We look, we'll look at games back in season and we'll think, you know what, we could have had six, eight points there, we've lost, and you can be looking in playoffs. But we're in the situation we are. Uh, it, it looked doom and gloomed at one stage. I mean, it looked um, 100% sure we, we were going down. We were at bottom at Powell, two points. Didn't look like picking any wins up from anywhere. Boys have picked themselves up. Training's been brilliant and... We're turning it around and let's just hope it carries on for for team and club. Now, for every winner, there's also uh, a runners-up or a loser. Uh, and in this case, it was York Acorn. Uh, and after the game, I caught up with their head coach, Josh Mortimer. Uh, well, Josh, we're catching up in the aftermath. Unfortunately, I lost for your boys, 12 points to nil. How do you sum that game up? Because it just seemed like you had chance after chance and couldn't add anything on the board. Yeah, just just spoke to boys then, and I just think we were a yard off all game. Um, we, uh, you know, little examples, and you know, we we could have easily, you know, if we'd got, I think we just needed, what, if we'd have got over line, um, I think we we could have really sort of kicked on off the back of that. But, but yeah, we're just a yard off the pace, and you know, I just told them that you know they probably thought they could turn up and and roll Lee quite comfortably, and they've all worked hard, but they've just been a yard off all game. So it, and and and, and that's. Lee were very good, you know, uh, uh, the good value for the win, the, uh, the kicking game was really good, they pinned us back every time and, you know, I ain't going to talk about officials or anything like that, but um, I thought Lee were good value for the win, to be fair. Yeah, they, uh, I can't be sat here saying we've been robbed, because no, we weren't. No. So, yeah. I, I mean, I will, I will say as well, you did have a couple of outstanding players in your ranks, I yeah. mean, Alfie Crawford was just a, a real yeah. inspiration, is, really, at yeah. nine. Yeah, he's good lad, he's good, real good kid is Alf, and... Um, you know, we, we tried to use him quite explosively and we, we, we lost his main halfback quite early on. Um, and, you know, we, we had a, well, we, we had to rejig tw- team twice. But, but yeah, I, I, well, out of a pretty dull showing, I think Alf was probably my highlight. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a good kid, real good kid. I've got to say as well, you're two second rowers. You know, uh, yeah, the moments yeah, as yeah, well, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, jo- Joe and George, they, they work, you know, they work their absolute knackers off. And, and when... On a, on a drier day in, in better ball, them, them two are really potent for us. But you know, we we didn't earn the right today to, to get get good ball. So you know, they don't think you saw the best of them. You know, they worked hard, but they didn't see them in doing the glamour stuff. I don't think. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, fortunately, you've always got another week, mm-hmm. you know, to do it. Um, yep. Next week, um, you know, I'll, I'll be chatting to you again, you know, sort of this time next week, you yeah, know, yeah. About, about the the game that you've got coming up against Rochdale Mayfield, but. Mm-hmm. Um, have you got some work to do this week? Uh, yeah, yeah, we definitely have. Yeah, um, uh, you know, we were hoping to go into the Rochdale game. You know, four wins on the bounce. We haven't done that, so you know, we've got to start again. Um, we last week's win of a lot lane sort of give us a bit of a buffer on teams that are chasing for playoff places, and obviously, we I don't know any of the results this week, and uh, that that's going to put more pressure on us. Um, and we, we need to be getting something from that. But, you know, Rock, Rochdale are a brilliant team. And, and when we played them at their place, they um, they wiped the floor with us. We we were so far off the pace and, and got bullied by them. So we're going to have to do a lot of hard work this week and, uh, you know, certainly front up and, and give a good account of ourselves, yeah. yeah. Josh, I always appreciate it when people front up even after losses because I know that you don't really want to be having <laughs> no. these sort of chats in no. fairness. But no. thank you very much. No, really no, appreciate cheers, it. Dave. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. So Josh Mortimer, the particularly disappointed, you know, with his side, um, 
rude the mischances and perhaps not being able to land the glove, but did point to the fact that they lost several players and he had to reshuffle. Yeah. Um, uh, but he knew that they were a. The, he described it as being a step off all the way through the game, and yeah. that, that's probably a, a good description. Or another day, things would have gelled and clicked in in far better fashion. But he just seemed that every pass that was going to lead to points was just off the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing is, we've been on about York Aircon. How obviously they started off a little bit, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I suppose, where they finished last season, but really started putting it together and, and, and turning in some really good results and, and, and some great efforts. So uh, I I would have thought they, they, they probably not targeted Lee Miners, but I would have thought, you know, we've got a good chance here. But uh, yeah. It, uh, it, it can understand why he's disappointed. On a lighter note, that's now two clubs in the NCL that are happy to see me when I turn up because <laughs> it means that generally they tend to win. Um, you, you know what the strange thing is, though? Both of those clubs come up against each other at the weekend. So one's going to be happy. Thato play off against uh, Lee Miners Rangers on Friday oh, night. Yeah, yeah. Over at Thato. Um, so one coach is going to be very happy if I turn up and the other coach isn't. And he's going to be banning me from the ground again. So um, we'll have to wait and see how that one goes. Right, Division 1, um, Crossfields 16, West Bowling 44. I don't think anything is going to stop West Ball in this no, season. They, agree, yeah. they are just tremendous. They're a great side to watch. We've talked over the last few years about how they've been developing and developing and developing, and, and they're in such a good good position now, aren't they? Such a strong position. Six points clear of the chasing pack. Um, so Taylor and Simpson both grabbing two tries each. Williams chipping in with six goals. And interesting as well from Williams' point of view, because we've spoke of him quite often about being a halfback. He played loose forward at the weekend. Oh. So because they've got um, a whole multitude of players that seem to just be able to boss the middle of the field, yeah. um, he, even even Harry Williams and a player of his experience and his know-how is now not playing in, in, in the halfback, mm. which is, is uh, for me, it's interesting to see anyway. Or is that just me being an ultra nerd again as far as <laughs> National Conference League rugby is concerned? Um, but a, a great result that for West Bowling. Crossfields, they were hoping that certainly they'd be able to, to, to be competitive in this game. I think they got that. They scored three tries, the, the Crossfield, so they'll be happy with that. But again, it means that they just lost a little bit of a little bit of momentum that they seem mm. to have been building up from the previous win against Ince Rose Bridge. Talking about Ince Rose Bridge, they were on the road. They went up to Egremont Rangers, who are playing some absolutely fantastic stuff at the moment. They are the second top scorers at Egremont Rangers in Division 1. They've amassed 554 points in 16 games. 40 of them came against Ince Rose Bridge. It was 20 points to 12 at half-time, hardly anything in it. But then Egremont found their second gear. Uh, and I've got to say, it was tries from Edwards, who grabbed two, uh, and full-back Fraser McNee, who also grabbed two, um, which really proved the difference. Uh, Tyson kicking four goals. They're just playing some tremendous attacking yeah. stuff at the moment, aren't they, Egremont? And I know they're a side that you've seen a little bit earlier. Yeah, I saw, I saw them up against Clockface uh, a, a few weeks ago uh, on, on a blistering hot day uh, and yeah uh, if you remember I, I commented on the, the size of the team that you know they were all well built I, I, I don't mean overweight or anything like that they were, I mean from from winger centre second row etc they were all tall solid lads and played some really really good stuff and that seems to have continued yes, doesn't it you know, much, they're, yes. they're very much a, a, a confident side now yeah. aren't they you know which is, is good to see considering they got relegated from um, the National Conference Premier Division last season uh, and we know when we look at relegated sides sometimes they really really struggle you've only got to look at Pilkington Rex who we'll mention in just a mm-hmm. minute um, as a side that is struggling you know that has only been able to win three of 16 games since coming down uh, Egremont have won 11 they've put them in a perfect position to be chasing yeah. um, promotion, haven't they, come the season's end. Um, another side that's doing particularly well at the moment is Heweth. Um Now, they had a hat-trick from Sturdy, two tries each from Richmond and Dent. Um, it just seemed whoever was closest to the ball ended up trying to kick a goal in that one, though, to be fair, because they had goals from Craig, Sadler, who kicked two, Dyson, Dent and Elliot. 
So I think it was whoever we finished closest to the ball just had a go at kicking the goal. Uh, 50 points to nil against Thornhill Trojans. They, they're battling hard, but they've just lost so much experience, Thornhill Trojans, that un- unfortunately they've got a really young squad that is learning lessons but not quick enough for the yeah, division yeah. that they're in. Um, but I have a feeling that they'll come back stronger for the experience in coming years. Mm-hmm. They have got some quality quality young kids that are starting to come through um, a, a big player who got mentioned in the, the match report that I saw regarding this game was Harvey Roberts who was the captain of the Community Lions under 16s mm. team last year now he's a prop forward and if he's playing prop at 17 yeah. in the first team he's got a lot to learn but it also points to promise moving forward doesn't it very much yeah yeah um, now, Skirler, they also returned to winning ways. They defeated Pilkington Rex by 24 points to six. They were leading by 12 points to nil at half time, doubled the lead in that second half, uh, and did pretty well. So, 24 points to six, it's a solid victory, that, isn't it, against Pilks? It is, uh, and I'm just looking at the score, so Pilks, if I'm not wrong, though, is, is that uh, coach Jamie Smith? Uh, uh, it certainly is, there? yes, yes. Yeah, so, so, again, he's, he's um, been called out of retirement. Um, to, to lead the line there yeah. at Pilks Rex and I've said they're, they're a team that is in transition mm. and it sometimes happens you know um, Thornhill were, were, you know are another side that has has come down from divisions before and struggled um, Pilkington Rex have done it this time round where they got relegated and they're struggling to, to, to make an impact so it's it's something that you can be really you can get really involved in unfortunately mm. you know and it, it takes a lot to change a losing culture doesn't it it does and we've said this before you know winning is a habit forming which is great losing is a habit forming as well it's not great but it's it, it's it's one of those you've got to try and get out of it uh, and obviously from uh, I was mentioning Jamie Smith the Obviously, a goal kicking uh, uh, Tom Connick converting converting their try. Another guy who obviously his name synonymous uh, with Pilks. Uh, a lot of new guys are going to be coming through. Uh, they're having it tough. They're having it tough, but they'll bounce back. They're a good club as a whole. Oh yeah, uh, you know they've got they've got the structures in place. It's just sometimes it uh, you know you've got to go a couple of steps backwards before you can go forward. That's right. Now, one other result that we haven't given you from Division 1, this saw Stanningley defeat Ulton Raiders 24 points to nil. Now, I can confirm, because we see a lot of 24 nils, don't mm-hmm. we? And sometimes these are walkovers yeah. which are in other divisions. No, this one isn't. No. This one isn't. This is a genuine <laughs> 24 niler. And uh, four tries scored by Stanningley. Two of them went going the way of Metcalf. Butterill kicking four goals. Great win that for Stanley Lee actually at home against Alton Raiders because, you know, they're, they're a side that can certainly pose a few problems for teams. I know certainly during the, the opening stages of the season, they were right up near the top. Now, they have had a bit of an up and down second half of the season so far, Alton, but on the day, they can still push forward and they're still well within those playoff zones. So if well, you look at, if you look at the current playoff position, so if we were to draw a line in the sand right now, You've got West Bowling and Egremont that are heading into the Prem. The prem mm. uh, and you've got a playoff positions, uh, Heworth, Skirlet, Stanley and Alton. You'd be happy with those four clubs playing off, wouldn't you, to be mm. fair, with the way that they've gone. Um, but, you know, there's still a bit of time left. There's still uh, some games left for clock face, for even Crossfields and even Inchrose Bridge to have a late charge. Yeah, I mean, clock face, though, they've only played 14 games, so they've got they've got a game less than, uh, or two less than some of the others. Obviously, they've got to win those, but like you say, you still can put them in the mix and uh, and, and, and see how they, how they go. Into Division 2, and we had one of those fabled Dewsbury duels. So it was Dewsbury Celtic 12, Dewsbury Moor Maroons 28. And, and I've been keen to talk about Dewsbury Moor Maroons because um, quite often we, we look at Division 2 and we look at Waterhead and we speak about how well that they've That's done right, and how yeah. they've developed and how they've been able to, you know, um, have that really good mixture of... Um, both experience and youth, which is coming through, which you need. But we've also got to start talking about Dewsbury Moor Maroons in the same way because they've won just as many games have uh, as Waterhead this season. They've won 13 games. They've lost three. This latest result saw them win by 28 points to 12 against Dewsbury Celtic. couple of tries there from the excellent Mr Sam, who is a prolific try-scoring prop forward. 
Um, so he always is right at the top end of the tries as far as GSB Moore Maroons are concerned. They were actually leading 24-6 at half time, so Celtic did come back in the second half, but didn't have enough points in them to, to really trouble the result. Elsewhere, there was a, an excellent win for Milford over Wigan St. Jude's by 30 points to 22. Um, and, and looking at this one, Coates grabbing a couple of tries. Uh, best the halfback kicking five oh, goals, goals yeah. uh, which proved to be important in the final, final result. Jude's were well served by Turner topping Rothwell, um, who could try and kick three goals, but it's another defeat as far as they're concerned. Might and Warriors, they were defeated at home. This was a close run thing at half time, trailing just 10 points to 16 against Normanton Knights, but Normanton getting away in the second half. Jacob Crossland with an inspired performance there, stubbly scoring a couple of tries as well for the Knights. Um, that's impressive, and they're starting to put a couple of results together now in Normanton after, I think, what they consider themselves to be a very inconsistent season so far, to be fair. Yeah, I, th I think so. It's just uh, it's one of those things that, if it, certainly an away win, if you can get an away win, uh, it certainly gives you that confidence. Now, this was a game between the bottom two, Saddleworth Rangers hosting East Leeds, and Saddleworth Rangers just about doing enough, coming out with a 12 points to 8 win against East Leeds. I'm looking at East Leeds, they only had one substitute. Doesn't, doesn't surprise me, Sam, I know that they were exactly the same against Crossfield at the beginning, or the beginning-ish of, of the season. They've had such a up-and-down season with one thing and another East Leeds be interesting to see how they can hit back from this as well yeah. won't it because well, but if you, you, you're talking that only one substitute yet they've kept it down to just 12 points mm. that is so going uh, uh, it's just interesting to see what's, what, what's going on up there because it, when when they put a team together I, I think if you look at some of the results they've had a couple of really standout results and then they've had real blowouts on others and then they've got others where they've got beaten and you think do you know what Actually, they're playing some good rugby here, and it's only because of the likes of, like you just said, you know, the, the short of bodies type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, a, a club that was hoping to, to to make hay, I suppose, at home was Shawcross Sharks. Mm -hmm. They were up against Barrow Island, who again are another team that's been a bit up and down over mm -hmm. the course of the season, pretty inconsistent. But it was Barrow Island who came up with the results, and they have to thank Dutton Rosconi in the main, um, who I know that you saw him play, I think, against Wollstone earlier this season, um, and you said that he was one to look yeah. out for. He's a, a dummy half player um, who's very, very classy, scored a try, kicked three goals, um, and with the help of his forwards, put them in the position where Baines could strike the field goal. That was the difference between the teams, really. So that one finished Shawcross Sharks 12, Barrow Island 19. So Walter Ed Warriors out on top um, with the same level of points, but having played two games more, Juice more Maroons are just tucked mm -hmm. in behind them. There's a real scramble happening between third and fourth, isn't there? So Shawcross Sharks currently in third, Wollstone Rovers in fourth, just uh, one point between them. Then there's a whole heap of clubs that are chasing the other two playoff positions at the moment. So you've got Jewsby Celtic, Barrow Island, Wigan St. Jude's, Normanton Knights, all separated by just two points. It's a close one there, isn't it? It is a close yeah. one. And who knows, you know, if Mighton or Milford can get their act together, or even Saddleworth over the closing weeks of the season, yeah. then they could push their way into playoff positions as well, couldn't they? Really, really interesting. Uh, the other game that I haven't mentioned, Waterhead Warriors 28, Wollstone Rovers 6. Uh, young Hamilton, as he did so often last season in Division 3, cross for a couple of tries there uh, and they managed to convert a 16-6 half-time advantage into a victory in the end so another win at the top of the league for Waterhead Warriors is anybody going to stop them Division 3 uh, this is warming up well too so you've got again the top four clubs there's just four points separating them now after this weekend's set of fixtures. The first club that I want to give a big mention to is Ellenborough Rangers. And they've got a centre called Alstrom, who's scored now 21 tries this season. So wow. he is prolific. He's one of the main reasons why they are where they are. Mm. A dynamic player. Um, they travelled over to Beverly, one of the longest trips. 
and they won by 42 points to six. So that's really impressive. And I think coming into these closing stages of the season, they're looking in good nick or Ellenborough to, to get one of the two promotion yeah. spots uh, that's available straight away. Uh, Driglington, they were playing at Morley Rugby Union Club this week. I think their ground was um, waterlogged as a result of everything that's happened. I mean, it has been like There's the proverbial cat and dogs, bit, hasn't it? A little bit of rain. Over yeah. the last few days. Uh, so they switched to Morley Rugby Union Club, who were the hosts, and it seemed to suit them. <coughs> Driglington winning by 36 points to 16 against Hensingham. We saw Oldham St. Anne's come into a real form again, a return to form against Eastmoor Dragons, winning by 54 points to 18 uh, Callum Cashin who'd scored 16 tries for the season prior to this game crossed for 4 Ooh. so he's now on 20 for the season there's a real race at the top of the try scoring charts by the way between him and uh, the player that I mentioned before Alstrom mm. so um, that ended up being 54 points to 18 um, they can score some points when they get the chance can all them send talents they're a good side to watch and then uh, Seaton Rangers they've been kicking over the last few weeks, they've been getting some closer results. Um, I've said about that how they went so well in the first season and the second season, they've not managed to replicate the same sort of form. Now, part of that, as far as I'm concerned, comes down to the fact that they lost about four or five of their team to um, to Workington Town and to Whitehaven. Yeah, you know, so I know I know it happens. You want your players to do well. You do want players to step up into the pro ranks and actually receive some re remuneration if they're good enough. Um, but it's really affected Seaton. But again, they're a club that's in transition and they're looking like they're getting closer with some of these some of these results. Yeah, very much so. And I remember discussing that similar sort of thing with uh, John Wells of uh, Agramont. Uh, and he was saying the same thing from the, their point of view, you know, where uh, you, you get... Certainly, up, up that neck of the woods, you, you get, you know, sort of quite a chunk of your players can can go out to your squad, yeah. and it can be disruptive. But it's one of those things that you know that they're used to to a certain degree, and and you know, sort of uh, buy into it and and, and fetch the next guys through. Because, like they say, when they go, obviously there's other guys in the, in in the uh, in the club who can uh, can step up. Now, one side that is on the up, I saw them at close quarters a few weeks ago, is Millen. Um, so they were hosting Lee East. It's curious that Lee East have cropped up in this. Haven't they? <laughs> East have been having a really good season, um, but they lost out narrowly to Millen by 18 points to 16. But not only did they have to worry about the two Tongan threats in the centres, the Sarmakis, who I've spoken about. So you've got uh, Naki and you've got uh, Jose. They had to worry about a certain Fui Fui Mai Mai who's landed up there in the last few days and played against them off the bench. This is one of the greatest stories that we've got in the National Conference League at the moment, this. Fui Fui Mai Mai playing for Millen. Um, You've got one of the oldest players around playing for the oldest club in the country. I want to know, did he actually go up there or did he actually stick? Because it... I know he was playing for Lee, wasn't he, a few seasons ago. I wonder, is, is he still in there only by any chance? Um, well, I think that's part of the reason of how they managed to get him, uh -huh. to be fair. Yeah, because I think he was watching, because he, obviously um, the, the two Sarmakis that I mentioned, yep. they're his nephews. Ah, so there's a bit of a family connection yeah, there. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, I think they've got into him. I think Millam's managed to do some sweet talking in his ear and he's gone up there so uh, I think this is a tremendous story it's fantastic uh, and, and who better to tell us all about what's happening up there at Millham this Tongan revolution than uh, our good friend of mine Rio McQuiston uh, Rio welcome to the show how are you doing mate you okay Hiya Dave, yeah, I'm alright, cheers, yeah. Yeah, it's all good time. seems like a while since we last had a proper natter, to be honest, mate, but um, you've, yeah. been, you've been going really well this season, haven't you, from, from a club point of view. I'm, I'm just looking at the league table now, and you, what, you, you're two points behind, um, you know, with, with like an extra game to play, aren't you? Yeah, we were, um, we've gone alright, to be fair, yeah. I think we've put near enough, we've sort of like set a couple of targets at the start of the year, and we're not far off them. I think we had... Um, a couple of like uh, tough losses away to uh, the top couple of teams where we probably dropped points. But apart from that, we've done really well, yeah. What do you put the newfound consistency down to? I think the more the thing is, is availability and like training. Okay. I think last year we did it, we had sort of like any away game, it was just getting whoever to play we can kind of thing. It was maybe like 10 
players who went everywhere. But I think we've had a real dig, and there's probably been about twenty odd players available home and away. Who's been like, you know, and then there's been lads from the A team who have been like, sort of like challenging our shirts instead of just, you know, when you're going to play because you're struggling for a team sort of thing. I think that's might be massive. Like you've uh, given a lot of lads commitment, really. Now, I know how you know that I love a stat. Um, and the last time when I checked, you was up right near the top of the try scoring chart. So that seems like you've been having a pretty good season as well from a, a personal point of view too, mate. Yeah, it's been all right. It's been, it's been all right. Like, that's, that, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's a typical answer from you, to be honest with you, right? <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's been all right. It's, we've all, I think the, uh, well, everyone's been playing. It's been easy, like, sort of, playing well, you know, and every old 13 year old, 17 year playing well, you just sort of go off the back of it, especially with like playing next to like Jack and all that and people like Brad, they just do everything else, do everything you need to, you just have to put the ball down pretty much for stuff like that, but yeah, I think 1-17 to every, every week's been pretty good, like. I mean, we were lucky a few weeks ago through bringing um, the National Conference League broadcast up to Millham, um, yeah. and it was a it was a cracking game that against uh, against Oldham St. Anne's. Did that give you a little bit more confidence heading into these last few games of the season too? Yeah, definitely. I think we were un- we were probably unlucky away. We had a tried disallowed, which was a bit we were, you know you, you get some and you lose some, which is not no nothing to blame. They did well and they finished us off, and we got that obviously disallowed like and. They beat us there, so I think coming when they were when we were playing, well, we always knew we could have we were able to beat them, sort of thing. But yeah, it's given us a lot of confidence coming in now. I think, especially beating Lee East, you beat like, and obviously we beat Ellenborough at home, so we beat all the, the top three above us at our spot. So I think we know we're able to do it, but it's just getting it sort of done in it. You, you, you can't put too much on that, can you? You know, being no. getting getting being able to beat all those sides that are around you, it shows that you're there or thereabouts, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is, and I think we obviously, as I said, we've, we've lost them away, but we've been, we've not, I don't think we've gone away and been like, you know, gutted we've played bad. I think Ellenborough were a bit poor, but ultimately, East, we've gone away and like really had a go. Whereas I, I said last year, we'd have probably just made a side up and you know just filled in a game, but this year we've really all had a dig, and you know it's quite, it's been really good. Um, now another reason for speaking to you is it, it seems to be um, you know second Tonga at the moment over at Millham, doesn't it? You've got uh, you've got the two saw Mackies in the centres, and then a, a certain Fu Fu Mai Mai turns up over the past couple of weeks. Um, I want to just talk about the Samakis first of all, though, because Naki's been there all season, hasn't he? You know, sort of doing his stuff, and what what's he added to the team? Naki, he's been class, Naki. To be fair, he come down training, and I think he was all union before he actually come to wars, and he just come down to training. And obviously, his um, his girlfriend's from Kirby, so I think she obviously knew people from Millham, and she just knew who to get in touch with. And uh, he come down to training, and he was a bit, he was actually dead shy at the first couple of sessions, and then he played. He's played since the first game of the season, like, but you can. Just I can't have to tell like, he's been playing all year now. He was a bit like union, sort of like union. You could tell he was not up to league, but he's been he's been class for us. Like he's just he's one of them. You just sort of like giving the ball and something will happen eventually. When if you give him the ball enough times, like he's just he's always like you know getting a quick look for us or he's just doing making making something happen every time. So he's been class really, and he's, he's been like I say all the time. He's been class like in the crack as well. He's just yeah. like fitting like he's never been away sort of thing. I mean that's fantastic, isn't it? You know, because that's what you want. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I know you lads up there. You'll have, you'll give him a warm welcome anyway, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, we did. But like I say, he's just coming like he's been one of us forever. Like same, same with like Jose. He's obviously only been here a couple of weeks, but he's just, you know, he's just like fit right in. Like he, like, it's a good mix of culture sort of thing. Like I say, we had the big do Saturday where all their all their family was down, and it was like there was lo- a lot of their family, and obviously all of us, and it was all just like a a big mix and it was class to see everyone was like trying all that sort of thing they had the hog roast and they had the, the, some of the drinks they drink and it was just you know it's just dead nice to see all the club there was all the juniors there all with them like nice to see with all Fui and Jose and all them it's just like a good mix for everyone it's been like a massive for the club them playing not just obviously for the first team point of view yeah and I mean you know you mentioned there about Jose I think it was his uh, his debut in the game that we covered from a, a National yeah. Conference League point of view and I, I think it was his second carry he went 60 metres and scored a try yeah, so that's a pretty good introduction <laughs> to rugby league that isn't it yeah I know, I know I think all the fans loved him as soon as he did that <laughs> like it, was, it didn't take him long <laughs> uh, but it, it's nice hearing about you know the, the, the fa- more importantly the family settling in as well because I mean that's yeah. that's a big part isn't it off the field yeah yeah it is they've all sort of just been like took under like sort of the wing of all of them and they've all just took him under like, like they're both our own and everyone loves them like you see them 
every time they go up around the town, it's everyone like knows them now and they're like, speaking to them and stuff. So yeah, they lo- I think they love it as much as like the town love them. Uh, so I, I've got to ask, you know, obviously there's a family connection there. I think Fury Fury Moi Moi is their, their uncle or something, isn't he? You know, yeah, but I think so that's it, yeah. have they just got in his ear and said, you know, come on, Fury, we're having a good well, time up was, here? <laughs> it was as much us, I think, as it was them giving it to Naki and South to get him to play. I think more <laughs> than anything, as soon as we sort of found out they had that relation, we, we've been trying, and he actually come and watch us at Lee East away because I think he's living in Lee. So I think this is I think that was last Saturday is actually Jose's last game for us. He's moving to uh, Japan, I think, to sign or doing something anyway. He's going away. Yeah. So I think it was sort of he said he, God, he won't probably get a chance to play with them two ever again. So seeing as it was his last game, he made himself available, like, and we had a couple of unavailable, so it just sort of like fell into place for him to play that game really. Now I know I know a couple of the lads from Lee East, and I know that as it was the I think it was the last big away game of the season for him yeah. um, so I know there was some 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 dodgy dress ups afterwards yeah. and stuff like that I think and I think a couple of them had decided to go as Fury to be fair as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah I did see a couple of costumes like I didn't see how it was Fury but I did see uh, they were all good costumes like to be fair we, we've got the same thing Saturday like we go to Beverly Saturday which is about four and a half hours for us I was going to say that's, a, that's some that's some crack that isn't it you know four and a half yeah. hours for you yeah it's a long way like yeah, it'd be a good crack, obviously, everyone on the bus and that. So, yeah, look forward to it. That's obviously, like, another massive game um, for us, obviously. Now, I think every game is massive. If we, obviously, we're looking to try and get the automatic promotion and it obviously depends on other teams, but as we just got to keep winning and that, you know, Beverly is going to be just as tough as what probably Leeds was as well because they're a big physical side, so... Well, I mean, to be fair, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether it's an advantage. You've got four games left, haven't you? Um, yeah. Saint Anne's and Ellenborough, they've got three games left, um, and Lee East only have two games left. So, yeah, in a, in, a, in a way, you can over the next couple of weeks, you can overtake Lee East, can't you? And sort of really yeah, start putting do, pressure. Should... Yeah, yeah, we can do it which, again. Again, as long as we keep winning, and doing our job, and then if the you know the luck happens and the other results fall into our hands, you never know. But yeah, we've just got to do our thing and win. Just keep winning, and that's all we can really do for now. Because that's like all we, as I say, that's all we can do. So I've got to ask you, as a as, as a young fella as well, did you ever think you'd get the opportunity to play alongside someone like Fui Fui Mai Mai? No, that was pretty mental. Like when we when he, we sort of like it was it's obviously being talked about, but um, we all thought oh, it's not going to happen. It's like it's gonna, we're going to talk about it, and then it's just going to get drawn off. But then. Me and we got my cousin Judy he plays for Milan as well. He's like you know we're nine now, and he was um we were both saying there's no chance he's coming. And then we like sort of Tom will put the team out Thursday, and he was there, and we were like no way we're going to be sat in the same changing room as him, and like actually playing against playing with him like it's pretty mental when you think of it. Like I know we he was obviously at work in for a bit, and he was at, like some of the lower league teams around here. But you've got like he's played New Zealand, Tonga, you know NRL like it's. it's Crazy to think you play with someone that level. Yeah, well, you but, know, yeah, been, it was an absolute pleasure. Like, I mean, he was class with us all. To be fair, so yeah, it was it was class. You've also now got a six degrees of separation now with Sam Burgess, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. Yeah, uh, I did see something about um, on Twitter. Someone saying that Lee should put a, a bit of a thing in for Sam Burgess to play against. Three <laughs> <life, but laughs> I'm glad he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, it's it's fantastic to hear, and and you know, it sounds like things have really been happening. I know it's been a special year for Millham as well, hasn't it? Celebrating the hundred and fiftieth, and I know that every single home game has had something slightly different to happening and and being named in the program, hasn't it? About it. Yeah, they've they've done a really good job. Like all the committee and every, like obviously we've got a bit of like a, a leader group which have been sorting stuff out as well, and we've just been trying to keep the club as busy as possible as we can, and all like you know, just keep stuff on f- to celebrate because it is a uh, a big thing, 150 years, obviously, like the first to do it. So it's been, there's been loads on at the club, and there's been, you know, always like the club's been full, and I think everyone's got around the 150th year, like so. It's, yeah, it's been really good to get like see everyone like loving the loving the buzz around the club, which is going on at the minute. And, and it's good to see that, you know, from an outsider's point of view as well, you know, and, and and great to get down there and see so many, so many, so much vibrancy, I suppose, around the place. Yeah, it is nice, and then it's obviously nice as like a club for other people to see in it. That obviously we're doing the right thing with, say, people like yourself coming and seeing how positive it's going, and then that's a, you know that means we're doing something right as a club. So 
Yeah, it's been good for all sort of aspects, I think. I know you've talked about going up to Beverly, you know, this weekend. They, they, their season's probably petered out because at the start they were sort of, I think, heavily favoured to, to be amongst the front runners again for this comp, having just got relegated last season. But it's not really worked out that way, has it? You know, and sometimes no. it doesn't, does it, at this level? It's, it's like a really hard one to judge this, this competition in Division 3, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. I think the, 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 we, we played them at home and they probably really should have beat us at home. It's near the start of the year, but I think the, it's probably the same problem I say what we had last year. It's the availability and lads like commitment. You know, if you get two or three lads not available and then it's just, you know, and then like someone else drops out and then, you know, it's just a tough one to go when you say, as you say, they've got to come to Cumbria three, four times they've got to come. You know, it's a long, long way for them to come and they've. You know, it's tough. Like, we've been there, everyone's sort of been there when you're struggling, but I'm sure they'll be back up there sooner or later. Like, because they were, I say, when they played us, they were a good side. They probably deserved to beat us, but we, you know, we won. But yeah, it's just unlucky for me, I suppose. It's just one of them things that happens to us all. Yeah. I'm sure they'll be back firing before long. And people forget, don't they, that you Cumbrian guys, you're doing this amount of travel anyway, you know, throughout the season. Yeah, I know, I know, we do a lot of it. Like, I think it's just. Ball of Cumbria, like just sort of second nature. You know, you're going to be travelling around a lot, but yeah, I think you sort of forget how much you do really when you think about it. Uh, Rio, really appreciated the chat, mate. Thank you ever so much for the update. And uh, well, uh, however long this lasts with Fury at the side of you, I hope it goes well for you for the rest of the season, mate. Yeah, spot on, James. Thanks for that. Yeah, cheers. Good to talk to you again. So Rio there, great to hear back from him. And uh, there's a lot going on there at the moment, isn't there, at Millen? I, t- I tell you what, I remember you speaking to him. Uh, was it last season when the uh, when, when we was in Italy? To Italy, be yeah, yeah, and uh, you interviewed him then, and we spoke about how well he spoke for for a, for a young lad because he's not he's not that old, is he? He's only twenty. Yeah, and that was absolutely superb. Uh, I, I mean, he, he was over the moon though the fact that he was going to share the field with very very my boy and I wondered whether it was going to come off or not but uh, yeah and I'm, I'm, I'm glad for him uh, and I'm glad for them all up there because the thing is it like like they say you know 150 years that is absolutely huge and like we were discussing the how it's so easy from from teams up that neck of the woods you know for have players taken uh, to, to go for play for the, the professional clubs that are up there and uh, it could could have been so easy for for that club to fold and other ones yep. as well. But you know, hundred and fifty years, yeah, absolutely superb. They've and done great well. stories. They've done yes. well because they've also been able to welcome back a couple of players that did go playing mm. professionally. You know, so you've got Ethan Kelly, who's back playing for them. Mm. Um, who's a prop forward who uh, I think he's played. He's played around a bit, you know, mm. to be fair. He's, he's been up at Whitehaven. I think he... I could be wrong. Sorry, Ethan, if I get this wrong now, mate. Um, but I think he was at work in terms... Yeah. I think he's had a stint with North Wales as well, you know. So, uh, he's a guy that's got loads of experience. There's Lee Postlethwaite as well, who I, I toured uh, Fiji with a few years ago now, who's back in the, uh, back in the community ranks and mm. doing a tremendous job as that link player uh, at fullback. You know, so they've got these guys that are coming back. They, 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 they've built a lot of experience, yeah. uh, and then you've, you you add into it the dynamism. The dynamism. Let me say it again properly. The that's dynamism. Easy for, that's easy for you. Sir. I'm putting my teeth in the <laughs> dynamism um, of the, the two Tongans in the centre yeah. so far. Um, I mean, you, you heard uh, Rio there saying that he thinks that Jose it might be have been his last game because he's looking at moving to Japan, Japan to yeah, take up yeah, a rugby union offer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the reason he's ended up up there in the first place was because his previous contract didn't come to fruition. Yeah, and then the old family ties have come in. But um, it's been a great story, you know seeing so um, I I don't know whether to call him Millen for the rest of the season or Little Tonga Little Tonga what do you think Uh, Tonga on sea it could be (laughs) Tonga on sea (laughs) but great to hear from Rio again thank you so much mate and I hope you enjoyed that interview as well at home let's keep the interviews rolling shall we but not until I've brought you up to date with what was happening with the England Community Lions under 17. So they played two games over the last week against uh, France under 17s. Uh, I caught the second one, so I'll read you my little match report that I've got. So France under 17s followed up their 26 14 win over the Lions the previous Saturday with a wider margin of victory on Wednesday evening. It finished England Community Lions 20, France 36. 
The first game had seen the Lions claim three tries from Harry Barker, Tyler Brady and Miller Dalton, with Jacob Rushforth adding one conversion. France had scored five tries in that, taking an early lead through Jan Dotris Padrugosa before Baker's converted effort gave the hosts a six points to four lead. Another Dutres Pedregossa effort nudged France back in front before Matisse Dumont added their third score and the conversion from Matisse Fresinou handed the visitors a 14-6 advantage at the interval. Tyler Brady scored first for the Lions in the second half before Keone Galliano and Anthony Munico went over for France. Fresinou gold both, although the Lions were rewarded when Dalton crossed before the end. Now, in the second game, France were impeccable in the first half, while the Lions struggled to mount any sort of pressure. The visitors amassed five tries, with standoff Mathis Freysinou having a hand in three of them, and also adding three goals to ensure a comfortable 26-0 advantage. Right-wing Nolan Sosse scored two tries in the first 18 minutes, the first from a glorious <coughs> pass from captain Lenny Mark while the second saw him react quickest to a grubber kick from full-back Loris Zamut. Fresh new gold to make it nil 10 and it got even better for the French, when after a fresh new 40-20, Kiam Benabou stormed onto a pass from Hugo Banque and blasted through in the 25th minute. Two further tries in the last 10 minutes of the first half from Jan Dutris Pedragossa and Lucas Nevu uh, came from Fresinu with the standoff adding one conversion to bring a one-sided first 40 minutes to a close. From a Lions point of view, the second half brought massive improvement with defence, kick pressure and chase vastly improved. France impressed early on with their eventual player of the match, Joris Fernandez, burying over from dummy half for Fresinu to goal. England Community Lions then had their first real spell of pressure, threatening on the left through Josh Langley, Harry Barker and Tyler Brady before the final pass was disrupted. The Lions kept going and scored their first try after 56 minutes when Langley kicked, France hesitated and Ruben Ruan got the ball wide for Lewis Topping to skirt around the defence and run around to the post. Jacob Rushforth, gold. Topping scored a second a few minutes later when Josh Hopkins kicked high. Marcus Giener contested and kept the ball alive on the last tackle for the winger to collect and dot down to make it 10-32. Fresinu kicked a penalty in the 68th minute for a late tackle, but England responded three minutes later with the third try. Cameron Robinson got there quickest after Langley's grubber kick took a ricochet. Rushforth added his second goal, and although Fresinu booted a further penalty, the Lions fought to the last whistle with Josh Hopkins scoring on the final play after showing great desire to get on the end of his own kick and that made the final score England Community Lions 20, France 36. So I suppose in some ways a bit of um, a bit of a sobering few days mm. um, with this France under-17 side performing a bit of history actually. It's apparently the first time that age group has come over to England and gone back with a 100% record in test matches. So, fair play to them. Um, I was trying to find out a little bit more about where a lot of these French players come from, to be yeah. fair, because you, you hear about it a lot, you know, and, and they usually look like they're pretty good at this age group, mm -hmm. but so few of them end up playing for playing for the big clubs. You don't see guys like this turning out for Catalan Dragons, for example, generally. There's a couple, there's been a couple down the years that have done that, but generally uh, they seem to end up, dare I say it, playing the other code of rugby. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was chatting to um, Dave Rotherham, who was, yeah. t who was telling me that apparently they've got like uh, big talent hubs where they've got about 20 to 40 kids in each of these talent hubs. They've got three of them in the south of uh, south of France. Yeah. And that's where the bulk of these guys come from. Uh, and that's part of almost like um, um, a sports school programme um, where the guys like Fresinou, yeah. who is Lawrence's son, yeah. um, he's actually put through a school where it's like paid... You know, it's like pri a bit of a private school, really. Yeah. Um, and they, they concentrate a lot on the sports, you yeah. know. So I just found that interesting, you know, because cause obviously we know through the the way that I talk about the Lions programme, how players get scouted in that, how they come together, they get nominated. 
they then have various times where they're training together and the squad gets cut down uh, until they've got yeah. what in you know what the coach's opinion is the best 20 25 players yeah um but i thought i thought it was a it's interesting to contrast that yeah it's um, a different it's format, good, good, isn't it yeah. it was good to mention it you Ooh. know because i you know i don't know how many people out there listening mm. were aware of quite where they get the players from no because we've said this in the past they, they turn up in and out around this age group don't they uh, i'm we jokingly say that you know the the 23 24 masquerading as 17 <laughs> uh but like like you say, I mean, they always put always put a good performance on. I mean, it's very rarely they'll go a way where they've got absolutely, you know, sort of uh, put the, the cleaners put through. You know, so it's, which shows that, like you said, there must be a good standard there that, that that's that's putting them uh, to uh, reach where they're at at the moment. <clears throat> uh, now. Let's have an interview, shall we? So Jonathan Mann, he's involved in the England setup for both the 18s and 17s. And I managed to speak to him about the recent games against France. So as we've just heard, England lost both of those. But Jonathan was particularly positive about the team's performance, noting that they showed true grit and determination and they had a good second half in the second game. So let's hear from him right now. OK, really pleased to be joined by Jonathan and Jonathan, um, you're involved in the England setup. You've been involved in both 18s and 17s. I'm speaking to you after the 17s games against France. Unfortunately, 2-0 in favour of the French. What have you made of the last few days? Uh, obviously, it's been a really good indicator where our run 17s are. Uh, also, regarding skill level, seeing, seeing where, where they need to be going with execution. Um uh, Tough, tough couple of days with the games. The lads have shown some really good grit and determination. Uh, but let themselves down a little bit with the basics, the, the catch and carry. Uh, but everything that's still workable. So it's a case of we can, we can get them where we want. They're still coming to training with us. Uh, so we can help get them to where we need to be. Uh, to be in contention for the European, European Championships for next year. But really happy with, with the energy and effort they've brought in. The work for each other. The work for the shirts has been massive. They've really took it on board and they've shown that extra bit of pride, especially in today's game. That's That second half today, we saw a big step up. They could have easily keeled over uh, after the, the first half. But and especially seeing as France scored the first try of the second half as well. Yeah, even more so because they, they could have easily just put put their hands up and, get and give, it, give up. But no, they, they, they cracked on. They had a good dig and they're up just coming up. Better, the better team on that second half, really, and at the end of the day. Scored some really neat tries as well. Really, really show that they can fling out wide and really pressure that French quite a lot. And to be fair, yeah, I mean, all four tries came from good, good pressure. Yeah, uh, which is what we was asking for for a whole game. It, just a shame it took to the second half before they, 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 they switched on and, and really put that effort on and put that pressure. Uh, we got two tries there from really good kick pressure, uh, forced, forced a couple of mistakes, which is really big, massive effort from the middles, making that effort to get up and our, and our backs. So re- really good shout from some, from those guys to not to not just throw the towel in. They have a really good crack at that French and, and, and showed what they could actually do. Um, I feel like I'm coming into this, you know, like um, not having seen a lot of this team, unfortunately, you know, because of one thing and another. I've tried to be across, you know, sort of all the age groups, but it, I, I can't be, unfortunately. So um, it was interesting me seeing a lot of these lads for the first time this evening. Um, you know, I thought I thought the fullback. Um, Rushforth was was excellent uh, in sort of returning the ball back, and then you know obviously Alfie gets the the player of the match. Yeah, uh, Rush had a really good good crack at fullback. Uh, showed some really good eyes up uh, and, and spotting, and he showed that really with his uh, community game as well because he's, he's recently obviously uh, moved into the first team at Siddle. So he, he showed he's taken on board what we've been working in England community lines and took it into his mainstream game and. He's been rewarded at that end as well. Uh, Alfie showed a lot of effort. Uh, unfortunately, with Miller going off with an injury today, it meant he had to do probably a lot more minutes than what we would have anticipated. But we set that challenge for him, uh, especially in that second half, and he took it with both hands and really had a good grasp. Uh, a few of the guys have mentioned there that, that uh, had a good crack. We had Henry Barker, uh, on the, our right second row. He, he did some tremendous carries. I remember a couple of them. He's got a, a vicious handoff, hasn't he? Yeah, he's really coming into his own 
right these last few weeks of training, obviously the last two games, because he had a really good dig in the first game as well. Uh, and that first game, he had to play a stint at centre uh, to help us out. And so he showed his versatility. So, so Harry Barker's has really uh, showed some willingness and, and, and applied himself pretty well. Especially in training, the last, the last two training sessions we had coming in, we saw a big massive spark in him. So, so he's, he's, he's done himself no harm. He's, he's really put himself forward for, for the European selection next year. And, uh, and Marcus Giener as well. He, he had a good crack on Saturday against the French in the first game. And then he showed again uh, a lot of solid runs and his def- defence is quite solid as well. So uh, we've, we've, got, we've got quite a few guys who, who, who more or less really push in some of the lads in the 18s for next year as well, so which, which is good and it's encouraging as well, really encouraging because we want to make sure we're always challenging them. I find it pretty encouraging as well because some of the guys you mentioned, they, they played in the under-16s last year, you know, lads like Marcus Gina, um, there was Josh Langley was in that, that set-up, you'd also got Ruben out in the centres who was in that line-up last time. Yeah, we had the three lads from the 16s, so obviously they've, they've come into a different environment with obviously the way we've applied our coaching sessions. Uh, we've also got Oliver Smart who's made the step up to the 18s as well. And, and, and you want to grasp it with both hands, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, obviously with the, with the captain and that. And like, uh, with Josh Langley, he's named uh, with vice captain and he showed today, he's not the biggest, but he'll have a dig at the line as, uh, for an half-back, which he's wanting for them to do. But he's also prepared, if someone puts runs at him, he'll put the shoulder in for a shot as well. He's not afraid to put his body on the line. And we've got a small lad like Josh doing that then it, 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 it does actually lift the lads around him as well. Uh, and obviously, yeah, we've had Ruben and Mark Skeen, Mark Skeen step up and continuing that, that that tradition of what we bring in at the 16s and lines and showing that you don't just do, get the one, you, you're on a journey with the whole development programme in the same light and you, you never just got get left behind after one game. If, if you're in the right area, you, you're, you're doing the work at trials or doing the work at a community club, you, you stand to have a good pathway through all the way up to hopefully open age or even professional contract if, if, if the, option, uh, the option comes out. And from a coaching point of view as well, you're also on that journey, you know, how, how have you been finding it? Oh, I, I've loved this uh, since I got brought in as a development coach, uh, just being around the environment, being around the different people, listening to different ideas. Uh, you're like me, you're a bit of a listener really, aren't you? Yeah, I, I like to... I see myself when it comes to rugby being a bit of like a sponge. I like to just soak in everything that's being said, everything that's going on, and taking it on board, and, and develop, developing my own approach to things uh, when it comes to things like that. And I've really enjoyed being around the team. I mean, I, I, I witnessed it from the outside as a parent last year with my lads, uh, and I knew I had this opportunity coming in from January. So it's just one of those grasping with both fans for myself and just enjoying it whilst I'm involved and taking everything on board, enjoying the interaction with the lads. Try and just have that little bit of chipping where I can with them and, and help them progress in it in a way because we're in it because we love the game and the day uh, and first and foremost and it's that enjoyment that drives us to just make ourselves better but help others around us become better as well. And that, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? You know the fact that everyone's in this program for the right reasons to do the right things by those lads and get them to the next level. Oh, definitely. I mean, like <clears throat> we volunteer, so that 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 says. It, from the start, we're here to, to to help ourselves learn and develop, but give our time back in a way. We've done it for, from a community level with our community clubs. We're always looking for that next step. Where can we go next? Where can we learn next? Especially especially for myself. And uh, like I said, I've, I've enjoyed every single second I've been involved with this at the moment. Even though it's took me to Cumbria to Yorkshire for the trials, whether it's been the 16, 17, 18s or, or the open age. I've, I've grasped it with both hands to get there to get other people's views and, and thoughts and to get to know the types of people you're going to be working with uh, because it might be a case at some point I'll be involved with the uh, under 20 or open age at one point so it's, it's, it's widening widen my horizon in a way and, and seeing what else is out there and, and, and getting a better understanding as well I, I... And like I say, I think that, that is, that, that's what the Lions programme is all about, isn't it? And it's so encouraging hearing you say that as a coach, you know, because quite often we reflect on the player journey. We don't often look at that coach's journey either. Yeah, because we, we're the guys that's behind the scenes. And at the day, we, we set a platform, but it's the players that go out and have to deliver it. And they go out and do the hard, the hard yardage, they go out and do the hard tackles. So... The, in a way, they, they always deserve the spoils. They do deserve the spoils. And, and it, 
and it's it's more of a you get a better feeling when you see the lads uh, progress from it uh, and and don't get stagnant or, or anything. That's where the worthy job is as a coach and, and for any for me is in any aspect of coaching I've done is it's always been for for the players and and yeah there's a lot of time you give up. I mean we have you'll find a lot of those coaches have really good better halves who back us up and and, and allow us to have that time uh, to to spend with a group of players to try and help them become better. Uh, so it, it's not all, always necessarily just within the coaching system. It's a coach's family or, or the team manager's family who, who you find aware as well. We'll be doing some sort of stint to help you out, even if it's like kit washing and things like that. So uh, it, it, and it's, it's kind of like what the whole game is about. It's that family ethos and, and, and it's all, it spreads throughout. I was going to say as well, do you get a chance to refresh now or is it straight back into community? Uh well, straight back in the community, I've got uh, obviously I'm assistant coach in Newton Storm this year, so uh, we've got a, a game this Saturday. We've got Ruse coming over uh, with the England Lions. We've got a three week uh, break, so we come back on the 19th where we bring our 17s and 18s back together again uh, to then build towards the next international fixture against Ireland. Uh, but yeah, so I'll, I'm still pretty busy with the rugby. My lads play, so I'm out watching him whenever he's playing as well. So. You find we, for myself, Monday to Friday, it's, it's my workplace. Uh, evenings, it's rugby training. Weekends, a lot of rugby still. So, and I enjoy the game. And I'm lucky that I've got a family that enjoys the game as well. So, uh, we all get to embrace it and, and, and take it on board and move forward with it. I really enjoyed that chat with Jonathan. And I've got to say, we could nearly have a podcast with him on, on anyway, couldn't we? So you, Jonathan, Superb speech. Jonathan is great because you get in a conversation with him and he, he will, you know, sort of go every through every facet and in, in, in explain everything to you. And many of the times, because obviously he, he's uh, one of the assistant coaches down at Newton. Uh, so that's where, where I know him from. Uh, and obviously his lad is, is Toby Hughes, uh, and talking to him, because obviously uh, the the things he goes through with, with Toby and, and, and where he's gone with his, his career, you know, he, he's telling me about things and how, how you know, how things have, have gone with him, and they, they follow him everywhere where he, where he plays. Uh, then when he started coaching, uh, he's been assisting uh, at, uh, at Newton, uh, and it just puts a different vibe in things. Because he, he he's you know he's great at you know sort of getting things together, organising things, making sure the lads go through the drills, putting things together, putting you know sort of uh, structures of, of what they need to do when they're warming up. Which you know I've mentioned in the past that that's one of the difference I noticed straight away when I started watching Northwest Men's League was the lads would come out and, and I don't just mean you now I mean, I mean a, a lot of other teams as well would just come out. Maybe a few kicks up and down, a few passing the balls. And then when I'm watching NCL, because if I remember rightly, watching Siddle warm up uh, and how it was structured, mm -hmm. how the Gus, you know, the, it, it was, you know, it's like, like watching, uh, you know, sort of Super League teams warm up and, and, and the total difference. And even just getting that on board for. Certainly, Northwest men's team. I, I think when that happens, it brings a different vibe to the players. I think it, they're up for the game a lot more. Uh, whether it causes them to focus on things a, a lot sooner, therefore, when when they're they're in the game, you know, they're, they're straight away rather than having to build themselves into the game. Mm. But Jonathan's great, and and he explains everything. And, and, and for, as a spectator. Which, which obviously I am when I go to a lot, a lot of these games, uh, it, it's really, really good because you know it's we we watch things happening, uh, and it's so you know sort of uh, easy to think, oh that's happened because of X, Y, and Z, or oh, oh why has that happened? And um, he's one of these guys who you can go and chat to, and he freely and openly will, will explain everything to to you. Which I, I love that. I yeah, really do love. It that. was another fantastic chat, that yeah, wasn't it? Re yeah. Really enjoyed that. And um, what what I wanted to get out of that as well was the fact that he's experienced things right across the spectrum with what he's gone through as a parent with Toby as mm -hmm. well, hasn't he? You know, so it was really interesting to sort of hear 
that contrast uh, and, and what he can bring to the Lions programme and it sounds like he's enjoying it and that's having a positive impact back at his own club too yeah yeah, and, and just as I said standing on the touchline and seeing that happen uh, he, he, he's great you know because it like like we always, like I was saying off air we were talking about uh, uh, community clubs uh, players from Super League clubs coming out I think personally this is my personal opinion that they should have to go to community clubs and help with coaching. And I don't mean just coaching the players. I mean, helping the coaches to coach, uh, to, to, to help them along, give them ideas, little thoughts, tips. And, and I think that's one way that you can build those bridges between community sides mm. and, and, and you know uh, professional clubs, whether it be a Super League size, whether it be a, a, a championship, championship one, uh, but it gets you some of that, you know, sort of continuity in that sort of sense. Because obviously the, the people who get get the the, the first line of, uh, you know, different ways of doing things are the professional sports. Uh, so it, 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 it's great that Jonathan's doing this and he's managing to, to, you know, sort of learn lots of things. But no disrespect, it, it, you know, that should be linked in with, uh, I think, the professional sports you know, professional clubs, you know, doing that on a regular basis. Then Jonathan doesn't have to keep going out. Don't get me wrong, he still wants. <laughs> he would still go and do the community lines because he loves his game. But I mean, for other clubs as well, you know, so so they get a taste of this. Because not everybody's got the, uh, you know, so, sometimes it, it's just dipping your toe in it. And, and some people are, 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 you know, are a bit standoffish in thinking, am I good enough to go and do that? Well, hmm. if you've got somebody who comes to you and you can discuss those things with them, it gives you that little bit of confidence that maybe you will put your toe in that water and move it on that and down the line. Dare I say it, this is something that we can do particularly well. So yep. they bring in the community clubs. They have, um, you know, days that are um, the meant for that community hmm. engagement. They invite different coaches in every single every single month yeah and um, I, it's I, the way forward isn't it yeah so much enough, from that. I, I was talking to a, a, an ex-player who uh, played a lot of a lot of community sides in and around the Wigan area and he was telling me back in the day he said uh, the, uh, the the England coach Sean Wayne Sean Wayne uh, was in and around all the local clubs, you know, sort of down there talking to the coaches and getting involved and, and, and vice versa. And I don't just mean the, the you know, the, the, the specific clubs who <laughs> we've all known in the past. Yes. There were certain clubs you had to go to if you wanted to get into a professional side. He, he was in and around all of the Wigan clubs and, and, and surrounding areas, uh, and, you know, to sort of get the vibe of, of what was going on. And obviously to find out what players were there. Which is, which is, you know, as as much as as a St. Helens person, they've never been a great lover of Sean Wayne. But, but from a community angle, that for me, that that's how it should go across the board, right across the board. If if certainly if IMG are saying now that uh, that Super League teams are, have have got to make, you know, sort of engagement with the community. For me, that that's not a matter of. Top players going out and, and giving balls and shirts and 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 just teaching it, uh, uh, you know, sort of little skills and things. They should be there regular, and be involved in it. And it should, there should be that, you know, real elements where they're, they're they're really joined together. Yeah, you know, it shouldn't it shouldn't just be a, a tick box or just tap your hat, you know, to oh we've done that now we've ticked that box. No, no, that that's wrong. That's wrong. They've got to get involved, and and then that's more beneficial and. If that does happen and you get a buy in and you've got a professional coming down to your club on a regular basis, you bet your bottom dollar a lot of those kids will, will start going to that to, 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 to watch him when he's playing for his club. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's loads. I mean, that discussion can just go on. We could oh, almost yeah. we could almost have just a show based on that discussion Very alone, so. couldn't we? Yeah. To be fair, yeah. um, I'm, I'm conscious that we're also 
Um, I'm going to be talking about what's happening elsewhere. Um, and I want to dip my toe, to coin one of your sayings, <laughs> into Cumbria. Yes, it's more action from the Holman Eagles and Premier Division. We love, it. we love it every single week. And again, thank you very much to Lorraine de Graff, who does a tremendous job in collating this information and sending it over so yes. that we get to talk about it in this segment. And I do so much enjoy being able to add a bit of depth to some of these results that come through. So the first one that I'm going to tell you about, Wathbrow Hornets A16, Loka 10. A really, really close run thing. Half-time, just six points nil in favour of Wathbrow Hornets. And uh, they had tries from Jensen Alstrom, Thomas Chambers, who's an under-16s player, who's popped his head above the parapet to play open age. Great story. Great story that he's been able to step up and score. Jack Casey grabbing the other try. Jensen Alstrom kicking two goals. The man of the match for Wathbrow, another young fella, Devon Sharp, who's gone uh, particularly well for the England Community Lions uh, so far this season. For Loka, Mitchell Todd and Sean Gill were the try scorers. Jamie Scott the uh, adding the loan conversion. And the man of the match for Loka was Emerson Allen. I love that name. Love that name. Um, and, and this game was only decided four minutes from the end when Alstrom did a self-converted try. So that's what you want. You want your competitive games, don't you? And this certainly was. Um, this next one saw Dissington take charge. They defeated Hensingham by 36 points to 10. At halftime, it was 12 points to nil in favour of Dissington, who scored first through Aaron O'Donnell. And then scored uh, a second try after 18 minutes through Jack Penrice. And added a third on 25 minutes through Gavin Martin. Then in the second half, Martin went in for his second. Clark added his first goal. Uh, Dissington then got over for a further try after 53 minutes to make it 24 points to nil. Harry Riley, the scorer there, Stephen Clark again converting. Hensing got themselves on the board just before the hour mark, thanks to Aidan Pirrie. That was converted by Ben Pierce, 24 points to six at that stage. And then we thought a fight back was on the cards. In with another try after 67 minutes for Hensingham, Scott Egan. Um, I'm glad to see Scott getting on the scoreboard. He's a good little player, you mm. know. Um, so he went over. That was unconverted. That made it 24 points to 10. They seem to be wobbling a little bit. But two tries in the last 10 minutes from Harry Riley and Robbie Worthington made the game safe and they finished with a 36 points to 10 win. Stephen Clark eventually ending up with four goals there. Do you know what, do you know what I love? The fact that Hensingham are called the Hens. The Hens. I, I, I love that. I love that. That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, Kells, A, they had um, an impressive victory against Glasson Rangers. Um, just looking at this one, at half time, they'd got it so that it was 32 points to 12. Um, they scored loads of points mm. here. Jamie Jennings with a hat trick, Ashton Sice with two tries, Dan Greers with two tries, one try each from Dan Starkett, Kieran Halcrow, Lewis McCartney. And Paul Colneen, who I remember him playing for Whitehaven, I think it was a few years ago. Uh, Dan Starkey kicking seven goals in total. You can't look further than a man who scores a hat-trick for getting the man of the match. Jamie Jennings picking up that result uh, as far as that was concerned. Glasson, though, they did rally a little bit. So Luke Johnson was the impressive player. A try and three goals for him. Matt Burns and Dean Jones, the other try scorer. But um, yeah, there was a whole heap of points added. Regular tries in the second half to make that one 58 points to 18. There was an impressive performance from Mary Port as well. They beat Ellenborough Rangers A by 36 points to 6. It was 18-6 at half time. Um, and Mary Port scoring first through Luke Barber. That was converted by Stephen Stoddart. It was soon 10 points to nil in the ninth minute when Luke Kremins went over for their second try. Ellenborough did close the gap when they got in for a try themselves through Kean Dempsey. The conversion came in from the brilliantly named Rocco Occasini. Uh, but two tries in the space of three minutes from Mary Port from Scott Atherton and Chris Iveson made the scoreline 18 points to six at half time. And then they had to wait until almost the hour mark before there was a change in the score. Mary Port getting that try through Chris Iveson, who finished with a hat trick. He followed up with his hat trick score two minutes later. Blake Miller on hand to add the conversions. And then just before the end, four minutes from the end, Stephen Stoddart popped up for a try. Blake Miller converted. 
36-6, an impressive result there. And then there was a, a big win as well for Cockermouth Titans at Egremont. They won by 32 points to 16. So the scores for Egremont were Luke Pye and Anus Alsebe. Uh, conversions going the way of Lee Rogers, who kicked two goals. The man of the match for Egremont was Caden Block. But Cockermouth were too too big, too powerful, too strong on the night. Alex Barton with two tries. Dan Craghill, Lewis Bancroft and Fraser Murray, the try scorer. The conversions go in the way of Regan Tinian, who kicked four. And it was that man, Tinian, who picked up the Cockermouth man of the match. So um, what that does is, um, well, it lines up another set of fixtures this coming weekend. Mm. So on Friday, you've got Dissington against Kells A. You've got Glasson Rangers up against Ellenborough Rangers A. And you've got Hensingham A up against Loka. That's a... Uh... A good batch of fixtures there, and uh, some good games as well. Yeah, I, I do love the, the the depth that we're able to mm. cover from from that now. Um, it, it is it is fantastic. I think you know. So um, thanks again to Lorraine for sending that information through yep, to us. We love it, and uh, obviously, with the more sort of information we get, we can broaden these things out, and, and we're getting to understand that 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 area a lot more now, aren't we? Um, Let's have a look at the Northwest Men's League, shall we, Steve? Yeah, no problem. Northwest Men's League. Well, let's get let's kick off with the results from this weekend, starting with the Premier Division. Uh, Blackbrook forty four, Latchford Albion four. First Finch twenty four. They uh, received a forfeit from Hindley, so that was a twenty four nil. Isham Atoms fourteen, Holton Farm Farmworth Hornets twenty two, Arnold St James twenty eight, Shevington Sharks ten. In Division 1, Charlie Panthers 22, Dalton 22. Uh, Forley Lane 32, Wigan Spring View 22. Salford City Roosters 22, West Orton Lions 26. Good win there for West Orton Lions. Uh, and Thatterweed Crusaders a 48, Caddis Head Rhinos 16. Then we've got Division 2. Ashton Burrs uh, received a forfeit uh, from Lee Miners Rangers, so a 24-0 result there. Goulburn Parkside, 18. Rochdale Mayfield, A14. That is a good result there uh, for uh, for Goulburn Parkside. Uh, Rochdale Mayfield, they're a bit of a dark horse. They're one of those teams were on the day, they can be very difficult to beat. And obviously here, they, they've uh, put up a good performance. Then we've got Wollstone Rovers, A10, Burnwood Bridge, 40. Newton Storm, 36. Roos Pioneers, 32. Good window for the Storm. Uh, Walney Central, 10. Hindpool Tigers, 16. Division 3, Higginshaw, 42. Langworthy Reds, 12. Rochdale Hornets, 18. Blackpool Scorpions, 16. Close one there. Uh, West Bank Birds, 48. Waterloo Warriors, A0. And the Crossfield A versus uh, Clockface Chargers. Uh, Crossfield's forfeited, so it's a 24 0 for the Clockface Chargers. Division 4, we've got uh, Banky Bulls. They uh, received a forfeit from Wigan Spring View, so a 24 0 for them. Uncall Ninefield, 32. Garswood Stags Reserve, 6. And Culture Eagles, 12. Liverpool Lizards, 10. That's a great result that for the Eagles, is, that, isn't yeah, it? Because yeah. we, we've been speaking about Liverpool Lizards being pretty good over the course of the season so far, haven't we? Yeah, I'm, give them due. We spoke to them, and, and we've mentioned this before, about them stepping down, you know, drop, dropping down a, a couple of, of divisions. I think it's bored them well. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I, they'd like to be in a better position in, in, in the league, but... They've been much more competitive, and that you know, a twelve ten there. That's a that's a real good game, and great to see Culture the Eagles as well, uh, sort of uh, getting the win. Then we have got the Alliance Division. Uh, we got Lee East a fifty six, uh, Oldham Saint Anne's a eighteen. So what does that uh, leave us from a, 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 a league positions point of view? Well, from the Premier Division, we've got Urs Finch uh, top of the tree there, nineteen points. Arnold St. James second with 18, uh, closely followed by Ashton Burrs with 16 points. And then uh, fourth, uh, just a little way behind uh, with 11 points is Shevington Sharks. Down to Division 1, Foley Lane, top of the tree, 20 points. 
just ahead of Wigan Spring View on 19 points. Then a, a short gap between them and Dalton, who are on 15 points, uh, but close on their tail is Tatawith Crusaders A with 14 points. Division 2, we've got Burnwood Bridge, top of the tree, uh, with 20 points. Although I do believe that may have changed round slightly now. I think Black, okay. I think Goldburn are actually uh, uh, top because of uh, they played one match more. But I, I think it's 21 points to, to Goldburn and Bob. Burnwood Bridge, 20. Newton Storm in third on 16 points. Then Ashton Burrs A on 15 points. Uh, Division 3, we've got Westbank Burrs, uh, 18 points, uh, just ahead of Higginshaw with 16. Uh, after that, we've got uh, Crossfield A, uh, 14 points, just two points ahead of Garswood Stags. Down to Division 4, we've got Runcorn Highfield, 22 points, uh, just followed by Bank Key Bulls on 16 points. And then we've got Culture Eagles, a uh, little way back, but on 9 points. So uh, uh, we've, then we've got Bolton, who are on eight points. So it's great to see them there in that in that top four. So uh, we've got Alliance, Oldham St. Town, 16 points. Uh, Lee East, uh, 10 points. Ince Rose Bridge, five points. And Wigan St. Jude's, uh, they're on four points. So uh, as uh, who might win the playoffs in, in the various uh, divisions. A bit too early to say at the moment. However, the teams that are currently in those top fours are, are all in very strong position, positions. And in the Premier Division, Nurse Finch and Arnold St James are the, are the clear favourites. They've both been playing some very well and have a good chance of finishing. Uh, either have got a good chance of finishing top of the table. However, Ashton Burrs are in the mix. I was going to say, um, you, you didn't, could surprise you didn't mention Ashton Burrs. There'll be mm. people up until that point throwing stuff at the podcast. <laughs> no, no, those three teams at the moment uh, certainly uh, are the ones where it's hard to call, to, to be fair. I think Alton Farnworth are in and around as well. Mm. Uh, in Division 1, Foley Lane and Wigan Springview, they're the two teams to watch. Uh, they've both been very consistent so far and are likely to be the contenders for the playoffs. Although Dalton and Tatooine Crusaders here are also potential dark horses. Division 2 brings in Burnwood Bridge and Goldburn Parkside are the two teams uh, to beat at the moment. Uh, they've both been playing very well and have had a good chance of finishing top of the table as, as well. It's just who is going to uh, sort of uh, see that one out for, the, for that top position. Mm. Uh, Ashton Burrs here, also a strong team and could surprise, again, could surprise some some some, uh, some of those uh, because all of those top floors, which includes uh, Newton Storm, uh, have got to play each other in the final matches of the season. Oh, it's warming up nicely so there, it, isn't it, it? It will really show what, what the final placings will, will be up for grabs. Uh, should be some really good games there. In Division 3, West Bank Burrs and Higgins Short, the two teams to watch. Both been, again, another two teams have been consistent and so far are, are likely to be in the mix for the playoffs. Uh, and Crossfields A and Garswood Stags, uh, again, are the, are the ones who uh, are the just behind and, and, and could cause uh, issues if there's, if there's any slip ups. Division 4, well, Runcon Ifield are the clear favourites. They've been playing really well and uh, they certainly have the chance. Uh, it's in their own hands, I think, for taking that top of the table. Bank Key Bulls in second have now put a little distance between themselves and Cutsworth Eagles. Uh, but again, on the day, Cutsworth Eagles could uh, possibly cause a little bit of an upset. So we'll, we'll see how things go there. I was quite impressed, to be honest, when I, I was covering the North West uh, Men's uh, Cup Finals mm. the other week with Bank Key. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the big story there is that they've come back and they're playing open age rugby That's league right, again, yeah. which is fantastic. You know, um, a lot of people will know if they follow North West Men's League for a, a long while that right at the turn of the century, for about eight or nine years, you'd got. Um, Bank Key Bulls who were sweeping all before That's right, they yeah. were they went on a, a massive charge to get in the Premier Division and, and they were so good that was such a good team mm. um, but again you know that time has moved on when you've got you've got young players uh, and you remember the dad's playing well, that's right. <laughs> and we, like we were saying before about various clubs in the in the NCL yes. as well. Uh, similar sort of thing with, thing with Bank Key you know they, like they were up there in and about it only needs, you know, uh, you know, a sort of couple of seasons where you don't get 
and other players coming through and it, and it can really you know sort of uh, put a stick in the works but you know give them the due they've cut they've come back with their open aid side and I've got a feeling they'll be jumping up a couple of divisions next season. Okay. So, uh, okay. I, I, I've got just got that competitive wise. I think there's them and and also. Uh, Do you think West Bank will be on the way Bank back are, as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think they they've another one who's uh, you know sort of uh, you know sort of getting back in there as well. Um, what about fixtures this week? Uh, fixtures this week. Let's you know, just check up on, on that for you. We have got the Northwest Men's. Let's have a look. Uh, fixtures, right? We're going to kick off on Thursday. We've got Latsford Albion up against Arnold St. James. So hopefully if the weather holds, I mean, it's absolutely bucketing it down with rain at the moment. <laughs> uh, that's one I may have a wander over to uh, uh, Victoria Park for. But then on Saturday at Premier Division, we've got Hindley versus Isham Atoms. Uh, Blackbrook versus Urs Finch. That should be a good game. Alton Formworth on it versus Ashton Burrs. Yeah, that should be an absolute storm. Mm. Uh, I saw the two sides play off against each other in the in the cup final a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that was a game played in all conditions. Farnworth somehow holding Ashton Burrs to just one try. They won by eight points to four. Yeah, and that's what I was saying before when I was giving the roundup of the possible, you know, the possibilities. Uh, as I said, the three teams that have have been in and around the uh, you know top of the table as it as it were are Ashton, as you say, Oral uh, and uh, Urs Finch, uh, but Alton found us on the day. It uh, you know you you just got to be be wary of them there, uh, but it's good to see. It's good to see. Uh, Division One, Ulverston, they will be taking on West Norton Lions. Caddy said Rhinos, they welcome Salford City Roosters. Foley Lane make the trip to Dalton. And uh, Thatterweath Crusaders, eh, well, they'll be going over to Wigan to play Wigan Spring View. Uh, Wigan St Cusberts, they will be taking on Chorley Panthers. Division 2, Walney Central, they make the long trip down to Ashton Burrs. Hindpool Tigers, well, they welcome Burtonwood Bridge. Uh, Rochdale Mayfield, they'll be uh, taking on Newton Storm. Lee Miners Rangers will be uh, a will be taking the uh, again long trip up to the Roos Pioneers, and uh, Goulburn Parkside they will be uh, coming just round the corner to play Wollstone Rovers A, so that's Division Two, Division Three West Bank Burrs they will be taking on Rochdale Hornets, uh, Langworthy Reds make the uh, trip to Blackpool Scorpions, uh, Clockface Charges A will take on Iginshaw. Garswood Stags make the journey to Waterhead Warriors Hay. Uh, Division 4, Bolton uh, uh, coming over to Culture to play the Eagles. Liverpool Lizards, they will t- play uh, Preston and South Ribble Rabbitohs. And Bank Key Poles, yes, it's the bigger. They're up against Runcorn Highfield over there at Runcorn. So that's probably the, uh, certainly in the Division 4, the, the, the game of the weekend there. And um, finally, in the Alliance Division, we've got Ince Rosebridge A. They will take on Wigan St. Jude's A. So that's your Northwest Men's Market. Over in the Yorkshire Men's League, well, the results, it all started off last Monday. Bradford Dudley Hill 24, Queensbury 0. Then on Saturday, in the Premier Division, King Cross Park 18, Newsom Panthers 26, Siddle Academy 24, Brighouse Rangers 24. In Division 1, Osset Trinity Tigers 26, Cutsight Raiders 4, Nottingham Outlaws 24, Hull White 0. And then in Division 2, uh, Family Falcons 0, Queensbury 24, Wibsey Warriors 24, Greetland Allrounders 0, Illingworth 28, Oddsall Sedberg 4, Division 3, Castleford Panthers 68, Sherburne Burrs 0, Elland 28, Methley Warriors 4. And then in Division 4A, Scarborough Pirates 20, Batley Boys 16. Division 4B, Keithley Albion Academy 60, Todmorden 16. West Craven Warriors 24, Brighouse Rangers 0. Uh, unfortunately, um, no results from Division 4C. In the Hull Division, 
Um, that saw a heap of games postponed as well, including Might and Warriors against Beverly. In the NCL East, it was Hunslet ARLFC 24, Norman to Knights 0, York Acorn 16, Hewarth 14. I bet that was worth going to. I know, uh, a York derby there between Acorn and Hewarth. That'd have been a cracker. And then in the NCL West, it was West Bowling Academy 66, Milford 16. There was even a friendly that managed to take place at the weekend as well between Hunslet ARLFC. They defeated Farnley Falcons by 30 points to four. So in the Premier Division, Newsom Panthers, they're currently topping the division with 16 points, closely followed by Fryston on 14. Doncaster Tolbar, despite having played the same number of matches, they're in third position with 12 points. In Division 1, Stanley Rangers are leading with 17. They're followed by Shalston on 12, Osset Trinity Tigers and Keithley Albion also showing excellent recent performances. Division 2, well that sees Wibsey Warriors leading with 20 points. They're followed by Bradford Dudley Hill on 18, Illingworth and Queensbury a third and fourth place respectively. And in Division 3, it's Seacroft Sharks who are undefeated and leading with 22 points. Castleford Panthers though and Methley Warriors they're following and snapping at the heels for the Panthers in particular. They've got 20 points and Methley, they've got 16 points. Division 4A, that sees Bramley Buffaloes leading with 14 points. They're closely followed by Westgate Common A, 12, Ghoul Vikings and Batley Boys also showing some recent excellent form. And in Division 4B, you've got the Birkinshaw Blue Dogs up front on 17 points followed by those West Craven Warriors on 14. Keithley Albion, though they're just waiting for a slip up there on 12 points at the moment, sitting in third. Division 4C, and is anybody going to be able to catch Upton? They're currently undefeated and leading the division with 16 points. Doddoth Miners, they're just a point back on 15, mm-hmm. so they look like a team that could catch them up. There needs to be a couple of results elsewhere for Derby Elks to get into that top spot. They've got 12 points in third place, respectively. In the Hull division, Skirl the Bulls are top with 12. They're followed by East Hull with 11. West Hull in third place with just 8 points. And in the NCL East, York Acorn, they're leading with 16 points, followed closely by Hunslet's ARLFC on 15. Ulton Raiders are third with 11. And in NCL West, West Bowling Academy, they're just following the, the results of the first team, to be <laughs> honest. They're them. leading a division they're f- on 14 points, they're followed by Saddleworth Rangers on 10, and Shawcross Sharks third with 8. Um, so, sides to look out for and performances to look out for moving on. Um, sees Newsom Panthers, Stanley Rangers, Wibsey Warriors, Seacroft Sharks, Bramley Buffaloes, Birkinshaw Blue Dogs, Upton, Skirler, York Acorn, West Bowling Academy, they're likely to maintain and be in and around their top positions. I think it would take something for somebody to overtake them. Um, But it's a close run thing in the Premier Division. Newsom and Panthers, they're in a real close run thing for top spot. Um, So yeah, some magnificent things going on there. Um, And let me have a look at the fixtures as well. So coming up this week, um, all the action gets underway on Friday night. So if you're near Stanningley, you've got an NCL West game between Stanningley and Shawcross Sharks to look forward to on Friday evening. Saturday in the Premier Division, that sees Brighouse Rangers up against King Cross Park. Westgate Common at home to Newsome Panthers. Siddle Academy, they're hosting Fryston Warriors. In Division 1, it's Nottingham Outlaws up against Keithley Albion. Stanley Rangers making the journey up to Cutsite Raiders. Division 2 action, as it's scheduled, it's Mull Green set to take on Bradford Dudley Hill. Those Kurt Burton Cougars up against Illingworth. Wibsey Warriors hosting the Farnley Falcons. And in Division 3, a couple of fixtures here as well to potentially look forward to. Uh, Burstall Victoria away at Wyke. Elland travelling over to Garforth Tigers. Division 4A action, well that sees Ghoul Vikings host the Batley Boys. Scarborough Pirates are set to take on Bramley Buffaloes. While Division 4B, that pits King Cross Park Academy up against Birkinshaw Blue Dogs. Newsome Panthers A are set to host West Craven Warriors. While Division 4C sees Doddoth Miners at home to Sherwood Wolf Hunt. Dern Valley Bulldogs travel over to Hemsworth Dragons. Rycroft Hammers are away at Derby Elks. In the Hull Division, Hull Dockers are set to take on West Hull. Skirler Bulls at home to Mighton Warriors. And in NCL East, Heweth are up against Normanton Knights. 
York Acorn travel over to Lot Lane, while NCL West, that sees Milford, hop over the Pennines to take on Saddleworth Rangers. Lots and lots to look forward to. One result to tell you about from the Southern Conference, that saw North Hearts Crusaders 4, West's Warriors 42. And the fixtures, if we're led to believe that these will <laughs> take place, there's bound to be a couple that don't in fairness, but it's Brentwood Eel set to take on West Warriors, Bristol All Golds are set to take on Bedford Tigers, Hammersmith Hills Hoist, they're away at the North Hearts Crusaders, Eastern Rhinos, they're set to take on London Chargers away. In the Barrow ARL, the fixtures this coming uh, week, well, in fact, as we're on uh, and recording now, Walney Central are set to take on Millham over at Craven Park, so we'll look out for the results on that next week. Uh, where else shall we go? Um, the Scottish title has been decided, by the way, Steve. Was it? Yeah. Already? Already, so the Edinburgh Eagles are the team that's lifted the trophy. They defeated the Fourth Valley Vikings in the grand final, and this was held at Grangemouth Rugby Union Club. Now, you won't believe when I was trying to talk about how this game was set to take place last week on last week's show, how many takes it took me to say Grangemouth Rugby Union Club. So I've managed to do it first time round this time round, haven't I? And, and this has not been edited. It it's is not live. been happy. It's not been edited. It is live. I can. Uh, I can attest to that. I, I, I am speaking as it is. Uh, the result hinged on a defining spell just before the break in which the Eagles posted two converted tries to turn a 12-8 advantage into a comfortable 24 points to 8 lead. Edinburgh closed with a hat-trick from Craig Robinson while there was a double from Billy Rockabooley. Uh, Mark Robertson, Lewis Clark and Sean Taylor raced in and Peter Burns landed eight goals from as many attempts. Duncan Arthur, who notched three tries, was unfortunate to finish on the losing side. He scored a hat-trick for 4th Valley Vikings. Callum Williamson and Gregor Ramsey also dotted down for 4th Valley, with Ewan Edmund landing a couple of goals. Um, elsewhere, Ronda Outlaws won 40 points to 12 against South Wales Saints in the South Wales League. Apparently this was the first Ronda Rugby League derby since way back in 1909. Just for the record in that one, and it's only because you want me to hear me say some of these uh, Welsh <laughs> places. Trebert, they won eight points to six at Mid Ronda in the last one. So that was back in 1909. Even I wasn't around then. Uh, right, your results elsewhere. In the East of England Premier Division, St Albans, Centurions 24, Hemel Stags 28. In the London Premier Division, Brixton Bulls 24, Elmbridge Eagles 0. In the Merritt League, East London Dockers 26, Medway Dragons 8, 42. In the, uh, no results from the East of England Premier Division or Merritt League. In the Midlands, uh, Leamington Royals 22 Oxford Cavaliers 18 and in the Merit League the Staffordshire Quantums 10 Worcester Rebels 42 and in no action from the South West Premier Division either other results in South Wales well Wales Jets 66 Signum Valley Cavaliers 12 Bridgend Blue Vol Blue Bulls. Let's see, I managed to say the difficult names. It's the easy one to get wrong. Bridge and Blue Bulls 18, Tarving Tigers 20. But that was a good game. Uh, fixtures this coming weekend in the London Premier Division. Brixton Bulls are set to host West Warriors A. Elmbridge Eagles will travel over to London Chargers A. Meanwhile, London Scholars A, they're over at Medway Dragons. In the Merit League, East London Dockers are set to host Elmbridge Eagles A. While in the East of England Premier Division, Hemel Stags have got Anglian Vipers in their sights. St Albans Centurions, they're set to host the North Hearts Crusaders A side. And in the Merit League, Invicta Panthers are set to take on Eastern Rhinos. The Midlands Premier Division, that's set to see Birmingham Bulldogs host Leamington Royals. Oxford Cavaliers at home to Coventry Burrs. And in the Merit League, those Staffordshire Quantums, they're up against the North East Worcestershire Ravens. In the South West League, Devon Sharks are set to take on the Tainbridge Trojans. Well, the South Wales League has Bridgend Blue Bulls slated to take on Siren Valley Cavaliers. Torfin Tigers set to take on Aberavon Fighting Irish. And the South Wales Jets are up against the South Wales Saints. Uh, so lots and lots of action around the country. Um, have I missed anybody out there? Yes, you have, Parker. Would you believe? National Conference League fixtures. That's correct. 
Ah, well, I was waiting for somebody to mention <laughs> that, to be fair. Um, yes, so the fixtures this coming weekend, I've already name-dropped a couple of these, haven't you I, have, to be fair. Have, so yeah. on Friday evening, you've got Thato Heath Crusaders hosting Lee Miners Rangers. That should be a corker, mm. should that. In Division 1, you've also got Under the Lights, Hewitt against Stanningley. Another potentially excellent game in Division 1 there. Then action in the Premier Division sees Hunslet ARLFC host Lock Lane. Hull Dockers travel up to Kells. Wathbrow Hornets are taking on West Hull in what is a real blue ribboned game. Uh, and the game that I'll be at will feature York Acorn and Rochdale Mayfield. That's on the Our League app. Three o'clock kickoff for this rather than half past two. Now, this is due to a, a, another certain Super League derby that's taking place this weekend over at the DW Stadium uh, between um, Wigan and Lee. Oh, the Greater Manchester Cup. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that's the. It's, 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 <laughs> Um, some people would say it's the bus stop taking on the bus station, um, but no, I'm not. I'm having none of it. I'm it's a, for the Andy it. Burnham Trophy. <laughs> uh, and the other game that I didn't mention, Wigan St Pat's are sent to host Siddle. In Division One, we've got Clockface Miners, the latest side to try and stop West Bowling. Crossfields at home to Skirler. If they win that, they can start looking up the league again. Can Crossfields? Mm-hmm. Ulton Raiders at home to Inchrose Bridge. Thornhill Trojans set to host Egremont Rangers. Division 2, Dewsbury Moor Maroons are up against the Waterhead Warriors. What a game in prospect there. That's the top two in Division 2 up mm. against each other. East Leeds are set to host Woolston Rovers. Saddleworth Rangers travel over to Milford. Barrow Island are at Normanton Knights. Wigan St. Jude's at home to Mighton Warriors. And then in Division 3, it's Beverly hosting Millam. Uh, you heard Rio talk about the fact that they were getting on the long coach trip. That's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, then we've got Dringlington against Ellenborough Rangers. Eastmore Dragons host Hensingham. Lee Easter at home to Bentley. Seaton Rangers are up against Oldham St. Anne's. Great set of fixtures again, Steve. Yeah, there's some really good ones in there. I must admit... Uh, Locally, the one that uh, I, I like is Clockface Miners against West Bowling. Uh, and I think it's just because we want to see how West Bowling uh, are shaping up because they've, uh, you know, they're riding the crest of the wave. They've, they've lost one, haven't they, so far this season? But uh, This is when we get to this sort of stage of the mm. season, though, isn't it, Steve, where you, you look across all of the competitions and there's some sterling fixtures coming up, isn't there? Some really, really good ones. Yeah, absolutely superb. And you were you were on about there about uh, the one between Dewsbury Moor Maroons and Waterhead Warriors. That's, uh, I mean, that's really going to co- cause a gear shift because obviously Waterhead Warriors have played fourteen, Dewsbury Moor Maroons have played sixteen. So depending on how that result goes, it uh, it could split that top top of that table open as well. Definitely, mm. definitely. So, uh, are you heading off to a game? Would you like to tell us about it? Well, you can definitely get in touch with me at Dave Parkinson RL via Twitter, uh, and we'll happily plug your game. We'll happily say about what your result is. We'll happily mention your they match report. Grit, they show determination. Whoop. And there's lots of determination. Was that Eddie Evans? It was Eddie in the background? I don't know. We had a bit of a guest, a bit of a guest, a bit of a guest appearance there from Eddie. Um, it's the, it's, you're not watching that wide to west try, are you? No, it's not no. that wide to west, is it? He was actually telling me how good Lee were at the weekend, but we won't go into that. Um, well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> First time in 52 years, mate. At Wembley. Anyway, anyway, I won't. I'm going to leave that where it stands for now. Um, we'll be back for another community show next week. Um, wh- where do you think you're off to this weekend then? If I get anywhere, it will probably will be the uh, Clockface versus West Bowling. Uh, I, I, certainly, the from a Northwest Men's point of view, the, the local clubs, most of the local clubs are are away, uh, so uh, it, it will be uh, there to see uh, Clockface uh, versus West Bowling, which should be interesting. Hopefully, I'll have some reaction from that game that's featuring on the Our League mm-hmm. app this coming weekend. Uh, do remember you can tune in from about what about ten to three. Uh, we'll have a little bit of build up and a, a good chat with uh, the people over there at York Acorn. It's a, it's a game I'm really looking forward to. Mm. I've only ever been to York Acorn once before, and that was when it hosted a Barley Yorkshire fixture, and they took on um, 
they played at Cumbria there. Yeah. Um, and it was a really nice ground. Also, there's a nice uh, discount supermarket across the road, so I know I'm sorted for my lunch. There you go. You can't argue with that, can you? can't argue with that, can you? Right, we're out of here, and we'll see you again next week. Do enjoy your rugby league. We'll talk about it next time.